and this even more in line with the comprehensive plan, we respectfully request action by the Planning Commission today to move this out of the commission with a favorable recommendation to the City Council. And we appreciate all of the time that you've spent as well as the City has spent um, these many months in helping us get to this point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we would like to hear from those who are in opposition to speak. If there are several, if there is a spokesperson, that would be helpful. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm not as experienced as Jamie, but I will try to talk slowly knowing that there's a time limit, and then also I know that there's several other folks that would like to speak. So if I speak quickly and you have a question about what I said, I'm happy to slow down, but um, just want to put that up front. So. Do I need to start the timer or does it start on? It'll start and go ahead and start with your name and address. Thank you. Okay, great. So my name is Kimberly McKenzie. Uh, my address is 4135 Rockingham Drive. Um, also, if possible, would love to hang out with y'all afterwards for any questions that you might have. I've been a resident of North Hills since 2013, and I'm here on behalf of approximately 42 residents of Lassiter Mill, Rockingham, Pamlico, Ramblewood, Lassiter Summit, and Cardigan Place. I have a letter here with the requisite signatures that I'll leave for the commission, and we take issue with the applicant's portrayal that neighbors were spoken to and were supportive of the rezoning application at the prior meeting held on April 26th. To be clear, we support development, but we do not support the scale of development that would result from this rezoning application. At both of the neighborhood meetings held by Parker Poe on behalf of the applicant, there was a consensus among residents that the rezoning application was simply too much. These comments have not been provided to the commission in any of the materials that I reviewed. However, the public comments included in the staff packet echo many of the comments and concerns that we carry. In addition, I'm also a proponent of an idea that you plan the work and you work the plan. The plan in this instance is the walkable Midtown plan. As members of the commission may very well know, the city utilizes its capital reserves for high priority capital projects and one-time needs. In fiscal year 2018, the, cap, or the city budgeted a quarter million dollars of these capital reserves for this plan. For context, this investment was more than the budget for new police vehicles and for fire department driver training in the same year. The city then spent the next two years developing the plan with more than 600 participants at in-person meetings, 1,500 participants online, and 20 citizen advisory council meetings. The applicant has stated that it, has not, it may not commence construction for this current site for up to 10 years from today. As the applicant is here today, planning for so many years out, I cannot imagine that between 2018 and 2020, with a substantial level of community engagement, at significant city expense, that members of the applicant's team did not actively participate or advocate for the role of its collective property holdings in the plan. Now that the city has robustly planned the work, it needs to work the plan. When the city budgeted a quarter million dollars in its capital reserves to develop a plan, it was making a statement. The statement was, in the city's own words from the plan, that the city prioritized investing significant funds to create guidance for this dynamic commercial and residential district for the next decade. The plan was unanimously adopted by the Planning Commission and the City Council in December of 2020, a mere 17 months prior from where we stand today. Notably, five of those original Planning Commission members are currently serving, and four of those original council members are also currently serving. Today, the applicant requests 30 to 40 story towers, which exceed guidance in table LU2 and walkable midtown guidance. Both suggest a maximum of 20 stories, if you, as you have heard multiple times. The plan was developed for just this type of application. The city and community members spent a significant amount of time and resources to develop this plan. While staff noted some mitigation efforts offered by the applicant that Jamie further spoke to, the impact of the applicant's requested zoning would be detrimental to the fabric of our neighborhood. We ask that you simply enforce the standards established through more than two years of city planning efforts and at great taxpayer expense. In addition, if approved, what's to stop each and every commercial developer in the district from applying for the very same variance? How could the commission and city council deny future applications without a display of favoritism? This compounds a potential future result of multiple such rezoning approvals. And then at the end of the day, what is the plan worth to our community if the only property owners it's being enforced against are residents and small commercial property owners? Lastly, the applicant has submitted a substantial increase in density. The, app, the approximate 200% increase is being forced on the North Hills neighborhood without sufficient infrastructure improvements beyond a bike lane from the 440 overpass to Six Forks. Kudos to anyone that can ride a bike up a Lassiter Mill Hill, but the extra two blocks is not going to be sufficient to tackle the infrastructure needs of the neighborhood. 
Our other concerns regarding density include the following. As noted in the staff's evaluation, the proposed building density would pose substantial access and egress challenges for fire service vehicles, causing potential delays and longer emergency response times. In addition, given the height of the Eastern, there's a clear and present serious public safety concern regarding the service capacity to adequately protect that current high-rise development without a ladder truck currently in place. How will pedestrian safety be secured? The crosswalks at Lassiter Mill, both near Quail Ridge and at Currituck, are already dangerous and within increased traffic will only become more so. Traffic across the triangle may be reduced, but at one of the neighborhood meetings, even Kimberly Horn admitted that traffic in North Hills will significantly be increased. How will our streets, such as Ramblewood, Lassiter Mill, Rowan, Currituck, and Pamlico be expected to handle this heightened use without improvement? Lastly, what open space planning and green street planning has applicant offered in proportion to the new residents, office workers, and visitors that it proposes? In summary, we ask that you please deny the rezoning application as it is inconsistent with the plan developed for these exact type of applications. Applicant's rezoning request does not provide a significant public increase in that capacity. It should mitigate the impacts of the Eastern with the ladder truck already and fails to account for the infrastructure improvements needed to support this supersized increase. These are costs and expenses that the taxpayers will bear, not the applicant. Thank you. And I'll leave this. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jared Cozart. I've lived at 500 Ramblewood Drive for over eight years now. I'd like to start out by saying I'm probably more pro-growth than the majority of residents, and even with that being said, I can't support the current rezoning request. I do not think that a 30-story tower in the middle of a neighborhood is a good idea, and I do not think that agreeing to add more density before doing comprehensive studies on this impact is a wise decision. I want to add some firsthand observations from a resident who lives on a street that's been highly affected by the growth that's already occurred. First of all, traffic has increased exponentially. One example of a small and, in my opinion, positive addition to the neighborhood is the Tesla superchargers. But yet even this has had impacts on the cut-through traffic on our street. Five years ago, before the superchargers were installed, we had maybe one Tesla per day drive down our street. Now it's probably 50 plus. The construction traffic is simply unbelievable. There's no reason for the Teslas, the construction traffic, and the cut-through commuters to be coming down our neighborhood street on a daily basis. These are all the type issues that can be identified and resolved with proper planning. Another observation <clears throat> that I have is that I have never seen a business professional, that being a lady in a pencil skirt and high heels or a man in a suit and tie, riding a bike down our street. Nor have I ever seen business professionals getting on and off the buses at the bus stops that are on Lassiter Mill. I know hundreds if not thousands of people who live in the area. None of them currently bike to work or ride the bus to work, and none of them intend to in the future. It is for this reason that I plead to the city to not solely rely on buses and bikes for solving the North Hills traffic issues. I urge the city to do a comprehensive and unbiased traffic study on the effects of these thousands of proposed commercial, residential, and residential, uh, residential and retail units before making a zoning decision. Thank you. I had a long talk, but I'll shorten it up for your sake. Uh, Larry Helfont, 1013 Thoreau Drive, um, Midtown CAC, Vice Chair. I sent you all an email, hopefully you've received it. It laid out pretty much exactly what you just heard from the residents. And on top of that, you have to ask yourself, what is this rezoning gain? What is the public benefit to this rezoning? Because of this rezoning, the firehouse has to be relocated because it was an inconvenience for the developer. The transportation within North Hills is also curtailed, necessitated the transit station and relocation of bus routes, all because of adding extra buildings on top of what's currently open space. The other thing you have to look at is what this is going to look like. You're going to put 40-story buildings along the perimeter of North Hills. How can you see the private businesses that are located within the mall? There's no visibility and probably result in lost business. On top of that, this plan is still not consistent with the comprehensive plan. 
the future land use map specifies a recommended height of 20 stories. How do you go from 20 stories to 40 stories? There's just no justification for it. The other thing is the 12-story building, which nobody has talked about. The 12-story building faces right onto a small neighborhood street across from school and residences. There is no step back and there is no allowance for the 12 stories. Midtown plan specifies anything more than five to seven stories should be, trans, trans, <laughs> should be stepped into the neighborhood with higher buildings. And there, at this point, there is no mention of it at all. The 12 story building is out of place, causes the relocation of the fire station, and is totally unnecessary. If you're gonna add all this housing, where is affordable housing? You're building on right on top of a major transit corridor, yet it's not addressed at all. It's in the Midtown Plan, it's in the Comprehensive Plan, yet it's omitted, and there's no mention of it at all. One last point, to make it really short, there's supposed to be a pedestrian bridge going across Six Forks at some point. There is no easement included in this application. You did it before for Z4521, you did it for Z2720, the north side project, but this one, there is no mention of it, there's no accommodation for pedestrians. The last statement I'll make is when you push taller buildings or any building into the space that's allotted, all you're doing is cramming things together more so. It's not walkable, it becomes more of an obstacle. It's already a problem with the fire trucks trying to move around North Hills as it is. Uh, a couple of them have almost hit the fountain. Truck has been in the fountain so far. Uh, thank you for your consideration and just remember that the Midtown CAC, which we don't do very often, unanimously denied this application. Thank you. All right, I would like now to allow for questions and comments from commissioners. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Sure. sure. Um, yeah, not really a question, but just a comment. Um, I think I, I tend to agree with a number of the comments that were made by the public. I think um, my concerns coming out of the last meeting had to do with, I think, three things, the fire station uh, um, condition and the, um, the requested heights exceeding what's recommended in the area plan and the lack of a provision for affordable housing. Um, so I do, I do appreciate the, the resolution of the fire station comment. I think that's great. Um, but uh, I think for me personally, I think the other two still seem um, unresolved in my mind and um, just have some general concerns about um, the value of the public planning process if we're not following through on the recommendations. Uh, thank you to the speakers and to the applicant and everyone who has written in about this case. Um, the issue of the fire department um, and the trucks having adequate access, I believe that the city has confirmed that that has been adequately addressed, the satisfaction of the fire department. Would you say that that's correct? Okay, great. Um, so with the resolution of that issue, the one other item that I discussed last time was the 440 node and the height transition there. Um, just to clarify my concern on those comments, it was not just my concern about the immediate neighbors across the street. My concern is um, that right at that node, that's a sort of key gateway to several, a, a large handful of some of the oldest neighborhoods in Raleigh. And this is you know, going down Lassiter Mill, if this building were placed at a high, at an extremely high height, right up to Lassiter Mill Road, you know, this is something that would probably stick out up and down the entrance of all those neighborhoods and living in that district. Um, and I'm sure the applicant can, and uh, several of the employees there can understand that concern. So I was pleased to see with the new um, renderings and also the new step backs and conditions that that um, appears to be addressed at this point um, the, with the step backs with the five stories, effectively five stories um, at the Lassiter Mill side. Um, I'm, I was pleased to see that height transition. Um, I wanted some clarification and maybe it's a question for staff. Could you clarify the diff um, any, if there is any change about what type of frontage is currently allowed or required and how that might change under this application? The 
frontage uh, is not changing. It, it will remain urban limited with the exception of the uh, Lasseter Mill node that is uh, going from parking limited to urban limited. So the, the, the frontages are already in place, okay. the current zone. Thank you for that. Um, so if this is not in fact changing the frontage either, and this five stories is far closer um, in line than versus the four stories um, in the area plan, and obviously it's much improved versus potentially 30 or 40 stories uh, directly at Lasseter Mill, and the frontage is not changing, then I wanted to turn to some of the other concerns. I wanted to see if staff could address um, what is going to be provided in terms of pedestrian and bike access in front of this node. and how that is changing versus the current entitlement, if at all. I'm gonna ask uh, my colleague, Jason Myers from RDOT uh, Transportation Planning to speak to that, thank you. Jason Myers of Transportation. The question was, how is the entitlement existing compared to proposed changing bike access and where? Was the location you're at asking? the 440 about? node at the 440 node which is the i'm going to use the screen this area right here correct okay correct the south side Make of sure that i'm remembering that um right now there is because of tc3 2021 an obligation through a, a site plan to wherever there is a site plan build a separated bikeway on a i think lesser mill is a two lane divided at that point um, I'm going to verify that, make sure I'm not. Uh, yes, two lane divided. Um, that is only their frontage. And so what they're doing is stretching through the zoning condition. So those improvements across other areas. So like this part, I believe, is what is currently under construction under a different site plan. Um, and also providing the option to put that on both sides of the street in order to, to make that link. Um, that's actually not in this area, but kind of further down a little bit. So it's not a significant change, um, but it is kind of linking together a, a number of pieces to help make a connection um, <clears throat> when this node actually goes under site plan review. Does Understood. that answer your question? Yes, thank you. And then what about any type of pedestrian crosswalk is that going to be changed or improved? Across Lassiter Mill. Across Lassiter Mill. There is no zoning condition specifically about that, but that's a part of what we look at in site plan review. Understood. Um, I think that's all of my questions about the 440 node at this time. I have some about the other side, but any other? I have a dumb question. Um, the 30 story condition I thought we put that forward as a text change and that wasn't approved or is the applicant conditioning down to 30 stories so I can speak to the text change um, the UDO was recently amended to include a 30 story height limit uh, as a category that. so that you might remember when the when the code was initially adopted it was 20 stories and 40 stories so a 30 story option was placed in the code okay I thought we recommended denial on that maybe council approved it so Thank you. I just, um, sorry, have a clarification on what um, Commissioner Ching asked, or Miller asked. Um, the six months notice, is that sufficient for staff to, I assume the applicant worked with city staff <coughs> on determining what that period of notice was for um, the go ahead with the fire station, is that correct, I think? That might have been included in y'all's response to Commissioner Miller's question. It seems like a lot of things going on for six months, and I just don't know what the turnaround period is for staff. On so the, is the question, is the six-month uh, time frame adequate for staff? Correct. The answer is yes. Um, I would also just like to kind of echo um, Commissioner Dottel's concern over um, community engagement, plans with community engagement that we have um, 
spent years in, in taxpayer, taxpayer city money on um, and seeing this, you know, the potential of a disregard there when we when these applicants come forward for their zoning cases. Um, I know things are changing very quickly in the city of Raleigh, and and those plans perhaps get dated. Um, however, we have invested a lot of time and energy um, and engaged the community, so just a general concern there, not specific to this case, but I think we're coming across that in a lot of our zoning cases. So I would agree with that. Um, that was one of my concerns as well, is that this was a very recent area plan that this planning commission um, passed with the support and, and involvement of the residents and then also the applicant. Um, and I sort of see that as, you know, with all of these rezoning cases, there's always competing policy interests that we have to figure out how to weight and balance. And um, one of my always key concerns whenever I look at these cases is always the, the housing crisis that's facing the city. And how do we balance that versus an area plan that was created um, even as recently as two years ago and how conditions may have changed since over that time? Um, that is so... And, and I tend to wait more um, than some on the Planning Commission, which is, I think, healthy and fine, um, my concerns about the housing crisis that the city is continually facing. And so one of the questions I, can, I ask myself is always, if not here, where? Um, and so for me, adding, 30, adding an additional 10 stories of density to this specific area to address the incredible housing needs in this city um, if we can maintain the appropriate step backs and the respect for not only the immediate neighbors, but the look and feel for the surrounding residential areas generally and the culture and history of the city, um, that for me on balance, that is where the, the need for additional housing and building additional units made sense for me at, at this um, point, changing the 12 stories um, along the 440 node to, or, or 20 stories along the 440 node to 30 um, with the appropriate step backs. But I understand the the other. I mean, these are two competing issues that that need to be weighted by everyone. I understand. Sorry. So I'll, I'll agree with that. I think you have some very very good points there. I, I do um, one comment that made that stood out to me from uh, I think Ms. McKenzie's um, commentary was that I'm concerned that those area plans may disproportionately affect the individual homeowners and small businesses that are applying versus more experienced um, developers with maybe um, just a larger impact and larger um, team to help get them through the process. Maybe just one comment. I, I do agree in, the, uh, in terms of weighing the the situation regarding the housing crisis and the, the added density here. Um, I feel like that's probably why the provision is in the Midtown area plan for um, making accommodations for affordable housing. So I feel like if that was also included as a part of this proposal, that would make it a lot easier for me to, to, um, to get on board with. But um, I don't know, that's just my, my two cents. Okay. so. Um Hearing the comments from the commissioners and the public and the applicant, um, I think there's some additional opportunity for um, to take a look specifically at the Midtown plan. Um, I do recall that the applicant was highly engaged in that process and should be able to go through and identify areas of improvement to align with the Midtown plan that was adopted relatively recently. I think the key components, again, are the affordable housing, green space, and pedestrian access. Um, as it relates to any additional changes to um, allow for the rezoning um, and to support the um, objectives and, and goals of the growth of the community. So um, any thoughts from the applicant? 
Thank you. I'd just like to clarify, because of the UDO change, we have made that condition, uh, the conditions changed once. We're only permitted to make those changes once at Planning Commission. And, and we did that intentionally based on the discussion and based on the public comments that were here before us on the 26th, which did focus on the fire needs and, um, and on that height transition. And so it was a, a very deliberate attempt to not only respond to the city staff questions have been brought, but those that were brought before us um, today. So we're not able to to change that um, today, which is why we asked for the the vote today to move forward to the city council. Um, of course, we will consider those changes and whether we're able to make additional changes um, at the council table, but we're not able to make them here. Um, and and I think I'd like to just remind the commission of that discussion before that surrounded both the Midtown plan and affordable housing and the reasons we changed the case in the ways that we did. Um, first of all, with respect to affordable housing, we did note that plan in in the Midtown, or that policy in the Midtown plan. But that policy applies throughout the Midtown plan in terms of finding affordable housing throughout the entire area of Midtown. What it says specifically about this parcel, and the parcels included in this case, is a, a very large decal with a T on it right in the center of North Hills that has a very strong desire for a transit center. And I understand while neighbors might not see um, the frequency of folks using that today, the purpose of putting that in the Midtown plan was to be able to expand transit services, not only for the immediate neighbors, but for everyone throughout the area. And so when you look at the specific request before you, the consistency that we heard um, ringing throughout the review of the case was that transit was a high priority need for this parcel. Affordable housing is a high priority, high priority need throughout the city and certainly throughout Midtown. But when you look at what is the, the future of this particular parcel, transit really became the, the not only the the most important need, the most significant public benefit, but the one um, that your staff spent a, a considerable amount of time working with us on how to accommodate, um, not just the needs, uh, not just the needs kind of provoked by made the increased density on this site, but the needs that exist today, both for fire and for transit. So when you look at those two public interests, we are meeting the Midtown plan with respect to what's most important for this particular site. Um, but we'll consider, we'll con continue to think about those things in, in terms of consistency as we go forward. The other thing I'd note is that when we talk about consistency with the Midtown plan, the main thing that we're talking about is height. And the, there is a specific policy in the Midtown plan that says when you're exceeding height or you're going above the height on recommended parcels, it should be offset by significant public benefits. The examples in that policy include things like stormwater, extra sidewalks. And I would submit that the transit center dedication and the fire center dedication are, are well above what was even contemplated in that policy. And so when you look at the public input of the offsetting of the height and the public interest benefits, we really have gone above and beyond with respect to what we understood through working with the staff were two crucial needs for the public interest in this area, which are transit and fire. So we're happy to take um, a, you know a lo another look at things and work with staff and the community as we move the case forward, but we're not able to change it at this point. Um, and so we request a recommendation from the Planning Commission today and continue that outreach as we move forward. Just to clarify, what type of additional changes would you be open to making if you were allowed to at this phase? That, that's hard to say. Yeah. I mean, I think we've heard some concerns um, that were consistent in, in the neighborhood meeting, um, some concerns today that were different from what were expressed before. And as you know, during the, the life of these cases, we're always weighing which are the, the concerns that are kind of most, most important and that we're most able to accommodate. So um, I don't know that I can say these are the specific changes we'll continue to entertain. I think what we'd like to do is 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 take stock in what we heard today and what we've heard from you all. Um, but knowing that the, we've already made the biggest commitment that we think this case bears, which is the transit center um, and the fire station, that they more than offset the impacts uh, that this case will, will cause. I have a question for staff. Um, <clears throat> I believe that applicants can make changes between now and council, correct? Only technical corrections to conditions, so not adding new language or adding substantive language to conditions that would fundamentally change them. Okay. And then, but there is opportunity through council in the public hearing process. That's correct. We could make additional changes, correct? That's right. Okay. Um, and we could, could we pass a case with including a recommendation of any particular changes? You can certainly make, as part of your certified recommendation, additional considerations you might want the city council to consider. Thank you. Oh, I, I had a question.
question for the applicant too. Uh, um, one thing that wasn't addressed, could you address the, the um, lack of conditions about green spaces and public art and the other concerns from the um, Parks Department? Sure. Um, I think those go into the overall um, mix of things that we've been discussing and, and how priorities have kind of bubbled up through the process. As I mentioned, we really focused a lot of time on transit and fire because that is what um, the staff really emphasized were the immediate needs in this area. And when you look at North Hills um, balance, this is a different case because we're not rezoning the entire thing. We're rezoning these pockets that are underutilized surface areas. And when you look at it on balance, there's a significant amount of open space, probably the most recognizable open space um, in that area with the, the lawn in front of, of Ben and Jerry's, and there's a considerable amount of open space and pockets throughout that existing area. When you combine that with across six forks, of course, it, it grows even further. And so what we'd like to do is be able to kind of continue to program those areas in, in areas we think are the, the best and highest places of use for that, that may or may not be these particular areas of North Hills. And so when you look at it on a balance, we believe those open space areas are already accommodated, but we can continue to look at that as we move forward to the City Council. Thank you. And, and one other thing that um, I think we had our first rezoning or second rezoning case that included it, but having simple things like um, pet waste disposal areas and things like that to, especially if this is going to be a high density residential area and people might be going across the street into residential neighborhoods to walk their pets, um, just sort of new considerations we have to start thinking about in some of these, in some of these new re rezoning cases that we haven't seen before. Understood. Yep. Um. <clears throat> I, I guess I just want to go on the record to say I'm disappointed again that I believe we have a case that's in front of us that is being hampered to find a little bit better consensus because we've restricted ourselves as a community and as a city to one round of conditions. This is about the third time now where I feel like there are some things. I, I'm also disappointed about the um, lack of providing open space, public art. I get it, North Hills it has a lot of it, but again, I'm to uh, harness Ms. Bennett, who can't be here today, I want to be consistent. And I, I, I have mentioned on multiple occasions in these higher density areas about the what I believe is the need to pay a little bit more attention to the civic space and the public space. And so I'm disappointed in that. And I, I'm also disappointed that I, I feel like we're forced to make a decision today where I feel like, uh, you know, maybe the neighbors feel like they haven't had their say, maybe the applicant would be willing if they were able to, to take one more shot at it, but we're not allowed to do that. So I just want to go on the record and say, I voted against that when it came before us and I'm, I'm still against it. I think what's also confusing for me too is that we have two more meetings ahead of us as opportunities to further discuss this case, but I mean, it's almost kind of a, if, if, if we're handcuffed when we can't make any decisions, then why do we have I mean, and I think it's good that we have the, the time frame, but at the same time, with only the one shot, it doesn't make sense. Well, so there are two different standards. One is a window of time that the Planning Commission has to review cases. So the, the code provides you with 60 days to review and, and make a recommendation or ask for a time extension. The other regulation is that you can accept one change of zoning conditions during that that period of time. So an applicant could appear before you multiple times during that window and solidify the conversation. And then at some point, the Planning Commission could ask for, or the applicant could offer conditions, changes to conditions. So there, there are two separate regulations that work in tandem. Okay, the way you phrased that made me think that we could potentially reject this set of conditions and ask them to continue. We don't have to accept these conditions no, it's, is what I heard. I'm sorry, that, that was imprecise language. Uh, so the, the applicant must offer them, and they have done so in this case. So they have offered the conditions. When I reference the acceptance, the conditional use process is the offering of conditions by the applicant and acceptance by the city. We just have to be partners in that process. So the fact that the planning department accepted those conditions, then, okay. I have a process question. I know y'all have had questions for the applicant, and I apologize if I'm out of line, but if I have a question for something that y'all have discussed, when is the appropriate venue to ask that? I'm, I'm curious what your question is. Um, well, it, I guess I'm just curious about you know, I heard your point about if not here, then where, which is an interesting point, and I agree housing is at a, a premium in our city. 
How, is there a condition that we can even say that those are residential units and not office units? I mean, is that, is that even possible to consider? Because I haven't, haven't heard that as a suggestion, but um, I think it might be more uh, palatable to think about residents in that area that are there, you know, at the off times and, and what that might look like. Um, and then the question I would have, too, is regarding the fire station, the eastern is existing, and there's not ladder service regardless. So that, to me, seems like a mitigation effort and less of a, a planning request. So I, I, it's semantics, but I'm just trying to learn. I know we do kind of have to move forward, actually, in bringing up the fire department. If it's OK, if the fire chief, um, do you have any additional comments on the plan? And does, this, um, does the fire uh, station, as proposed now, accommodate this future growth? Um, that was just one kind of open item for me, but. Good morning. Um, the plans that put for you before uh, that was presented, it does meet the needs of the current ask of a third bay and 80 foot base for area ladder truck to meet the needs of that particular area. And that's the future growth. That's the future growth, okay. yes ma'am. Great, thank you, I appreciate that, thank you. Okay, well, I think we've had <clears throat> good discussion on the case. Um, I'd like us to, to uh, make a motion if possible, um, if anybody here is willing to make a motion. Oh, I'm sorry, um, we have one more comment. Just one more quick comment. I just want you to recognize with the conditions that were provided for the fire station, there's only six months notice. Past history has indicated that it takes one to three years to build the firehouse. So what you're talking about is having a firehouse in a construction zone while they're waiting for some place to go. More than likely, the fire station personnel and engines will be relocated, probably to Brentwood Road. And I'd like the fire chief, I'd like you to ask the fire chief what's going to happen in terms of the interim status of the firehouse while construction is going on. That's a fair question. Thank you. With the construction of a new station number nine, there's currently an engine there and a battalion chief. Battalion chief be relocated, and the engine will go to station number 11. We're still within the time frame to meet the NFP 17 standards into North Hills. So you're good with the time frame, and, and there's a comfortable feeling about, I guess, being relocated during that time and being responsive to the area. Now, when you talk about rebuilding on a new station or new designs, you're looking at every bit of year to year 0 0.5, 1 1.5, um, year and a half. So therefore, the council and the district need to be notified that this will be a actual rebuild. So there may be extended times into the North Hills area during congested periods of time. Thank you. Go ahead. Did you want to say something, Dean? Sure. Um, if this does go forward, I would definitely would like to add a consideration as part of our uh, submittal to the council that would um, ask for some set public open space or uh, um, pet amenity space beyond uh, site plan requirements. I'm just throwing that out there. Okay. Um, I think that will go into the minutes. Um, in careful detail, I think it's to our benefit to review those minutes and make sure that that gets communicated um, to council. So that, along with the Midtown Plan, the affordable housing, and the pedestrian access. Um, okay, is anybody here willing to make a motion? You gonna do it? Happy to, thank you. Um, I'd like to make a motion on case Z6721 to approve this rezoning request um, and to adopt the proposed consistency statement located in the agenda materials dated May 10th, 2022. I'd also like to um, amend that consistency statement to add um, that the Planning Commission recommends that the applicant amend this case to um, add policies that, uh, I'm sorry, add a condition that provides accessible open space, public art, public, public play areas and or public amenity areas, or I'm sorry, pet amenity areas. Okay, Commissioner Miller has offered a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Great, thank you. All in favor? Oh, uh, 
I get, do I have to O'Hare, um, Commissioner O'Haver made the second and I, I believe we recorded that, so you're good. Go okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All in favor, of the, uh, please raise your hand. Okay. All opposed, please raise your hand. Thank you. Do we have that recorded? I see it was four to one. Four to one. Is that right? No. Five. Four to, five to one. Five to one. Thank you. Don't tell. Okay. Thank you, everyone who participated in the conversation and provided their feed. Thank you, everyone who participated in the conversation and provided their feedback on this last case. Okay. Now moving on to case number Z7121. This request was previously discussed at our April 12th meeting. The applicant indicated a desire to explore additional zoning conditions. We have uh, Ira Mabel as the case planner. I'd like to ask for a brief presentation from Ira Mabel. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, that's right, so this is the second time you're hearing this case. Um, request for R4 CU with the Falls Watershed Protection Overlay District and the Special Highway Overlay District. Um, the applicant has made some technical corrections that staff had previously recommended before, but has not made any other substantial changes to the request. So mostly I will go um, through a brief overview of where we left it. Uh, so this is the site just south of 540 and Leesville Road. Um, so Strickland Road address, sort of wrapping around the Harris Teeter Shopping Center there. Um, four conditions, so still limiting, so still limiting dwelling units to 20 maximum. Um, they have added some extra uses. So this is a legacy the, the district requested has changed, so, but the condition did not. Um, so they're just reflecting the, the current version of the request. Um, and then there was some technical language to three and four that's changed, but does not change my summary on the slide. It was just recommendations from current planning about where that, how that would be enforced or applied. Um, so consistent with the plan, still a feature language map in urban form. Um, the, I left the, the outstanding item, the outstanding issue in here, so you might recall last time, um, this case does not say anything officially about connection to Strickland Road, either positive or negatively, or um, requiring or not requiring. Um, but the applicant has expressed the intent that they will not connect, and staff said, well, if that's going to be true, you could offer a condition requiring some pedestrian connection. Um, so that still has not been done. Um, the applicant, I will acknowledge though that the applicant has talked to staff in multiple venues about getting that done and will fully acknowledge the, the difficulties of, um, that they face doing that. Um, but I will let them explain that to you. Um, so j this is just more that the case has not addressed this still um, and I fully expect them to explain why <laughs> and will not dispute probably um, their explanation for that. Any question before? Okay, great. So you did hear from, uh, I believe you do have to open up comment again. Travis can tell me that that's not right. Th that's correct, so the okay. commission would need to vote on additional time for the applicant and the public to speak. Do we have any? members of the public here to speak on this case? Okay. All right. Um, so we have already received an applicant presentation and heard from members of the public. If we'd like to hear additional information, we would need to vote to grant additional time to speak. Without objection, I would like to grant 10 minutes for each side. Good morning, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Worth Mills, here on behalf of the rezoning applicant. Uh, that was a pretty big cliffhanger that Ira left. Um, <laughs> it may not be that interesting, but I will certainly explain what we've done leading up uh, to today's hearing. So again, just a, a quick overview. It's, it's a rezoning of 16.25 acres from R1 to R4 conditional use, retaining the Shod 1 and the Falls Watershed overlay the, the falls watershed regulations are, are really what's important uh, in this update. 
again, we updated conditions that uh, prohibited additional uses um, and revised some of the conditions to meet those technical corrections identified by staff. Uh, for the pedestrian path to Strickland Road, um, on uh, multiple occasions we met with uh, planning, transportation, and parks and recreation departments to discuss the feasibility uh, of that pedestrian path connection. And although uh, we do not have a, a condition for you this morning, uh, I would like to note that the case is fully consistent with the future land use map and all applicable comprehensive plan policies that Ira and his team identified. So again, this uh, layout here shows what the applicant is proposing. Um, 19 single family homes, uh, no vehicular connection to uh, Strickland Road. Um, I'll note on the southern end here, we've identified a large swath of existing trees that would qualify both for tree conservation area, as well as for our 40% forestation requirement under the Falls watershed. Uh, there's also a uh, small wetlands area here um, that we wanted to avoid uh, if there were any pedestrian path uh, connecting uh, from the southern cul-de-sac to Strickland Road. So as part of the discussions with uh, those departments, Emily Rothrock with ESP Associates and her team, they're present this morning as well, uh, came up with this potential path um, that not only um, met the UDO's uh, maximum slope, um, but also tried to avoid the uh, wetlands that encroach into that southeastern corner. Uh, you see a switch back there with uh, the connection to Strickland Road closer to uh, the Harris Teeter Shopping Center. Now, transportation parks, uh, planning staff, um, from you know a high level conceptual plan, um, agreed with this approach. They, they thought this connection, this path um, would work. Um, unfortunately, um, and this is no fault of Travis's obviously, but we met with Travis on an interpretation because we wanted to make sure that uh, we did not uh, break up these two areas into two separate forestation areas. The Falls watershed, uh, in addition to requiring that 40% of the site uh, be preserved uh, through either existing or planted trees as forestation area. Uh, no one of those forestation areas can be less than a fifth of the total forestation area required. Um, uh, after speaking with Travis, uh, his interpretation of the code was that this path would break up this large swath of forestation into two separate areas and the southwestern portion we determined would be less than one-fifth of the total forestation area required. Which means that if we put that condition in, we would then need to seek a variance automatically from the Board of Adjustment at the time of subdivision and site plan review. Um, Travis opined, and, and I agree with him, that uh, it is uh, not good city policy to accept uh, conditions that uh, on their face require a variance to the Board of Adjustment at a later date. And so at this time, we have not uh, included that zoning condition um, in this uh, case packet this morning. Not saying that it won't be done, and, and I know that Emily and the rezoning applicant are considering ways to continue to make that connection, albeit outside of the parameters of a rezoning application. Uh, but that, I think, explains why we were unable to uh, add that condition for today's meeting. Uh, if you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer those. Again, Emily Rothrock with ESP Associates is here as well, if you'd like to talk with her about the path uh, and the four station areas. Um, but we'll reserve the rest of our time if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to um, now allow for questions and comments from, um, oh, I'm sorry, from the public. Is there anyone here from the public to speak? Good morning. I'm Brad Inman, uh, I-N-M-A-N. I'm here on behalf of the residents of Winbrook Homeowners Association. They're the neighborhood that adjoins the site in question here. Um, I'll try to keep things brief because I know at this point it seems like there's been a condition that's been recommended by staff 
um, the commission for the reasons that you all have just heard have, has not been able to be uh, added to the application. Um, so, you know, we didn't particularly like the end of the movie after the cliffhanger, but essentially there was no connection at this point. The, the real issue, I think, for the, the residents of Winbrook is con connectivity. I know that's a, a big deal for the commissioners to try and to do any kind of planning, and it's a, a, one of the principles that everyone tries to follow. Um, there's been previous rezoning requests for this property, and this goes back several years, but in, in that plan, there was a direct route to Strickland um, from this tract. Um, it's not the case here. Obviously, you can see the cul-de-sac is kind of dead end, um, so that the only way out and, or in for the residents of this new neighborhood would be through Winbrook. That obviously is, increases traffic. It increases you know, delivery trucks, uh, waste management vehicles, things like that. Um, and so, you know, the concern, of course, for the Wimbrook, and I think it's an understandable concern, folks, is that you're going to add 20 percent uh, to their neighborhood, which means 20 percent more traffic, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, it seems to me that the, the, the staff had a, you know, it, it, it frankly doesn't satisfy the Wimbrook um, community to have the pedestrian slash bike access. Um, but that seemed to be, you know, as good as uh, we could get at some point. But now it seems that that is not even on the table, at least at this point in time, unless uh, Mr. Mills and his group can can work out a better um, way to make that happen within the bounds of the, the, the various rules and restrictions of the watershed. So, um, you know, at this point, I just want to make sure the commissioners understand there is a vocal opposition to the, the plan as it's laid out, mainly as it has to do with connectivity. I think there's a block perimeter issue, which, as I understand it, um, there, there may or may not be an exception for or an exemption for. I don't think that's been spelled out, and it seems like that would be a concern also of the application as it exists, um, at least a condition that kind of specifies what the exception may be and what would happen if the exception or exemption is not applicable here, uh, you know, before this moves forward. But the bigger issue certainly for the residents of Winbrook is um, on, on connectivity. And again, at this point, you've got uh, a narrow roadway there at Saxon Way, which is a connecting road. Um, you're going to have issues with construction trucks to start with kind of coming in and out of that road to, to, to build this. Um, but again, with the connectivity to Strickland, which I don't think I've heard, it, uh, you know, the only, the only counter argument that I've heard to not doing that is cost. I think there's a slope um, as it as the tract heads towards Strickland Road. Um, you know, t to me at least, I, I, I don't think that should be a determinative factor. I mean, it's not a cost to the citizens of Raleigh. It's not a cost to the taxpayers of the city. It seems that the cost will be borne by the developer, perhaps passed down to the neighborhood um, homeowners. But, you know, if, if, that's the, if that's the hold up to why this connectivity cannot be made, you know, I, again, I don't, I don't think that should be a determinative factor. So the, the, big, the big issue for us is connectivity. And thank you for your time today. I don't know if there's anyone else here from the community who wants to speak or feel permit them to, but that's uh, what I want to say on behalf of them. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Anyone else from the public here to speak? Great. Um, I would like to now allow for questions and comments from commissioners. Does anyone here have any questions? Go ahead. Um, I need some education here. What is the definition of supportive housing and why was that added to be prohibited? Thank you. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> Hey. Sorry, I was going to fix the presentation while no one was paying attention to me. Um, so supportive housing is defined in the UDO um, in Chapter 6, which I don't have my computer up, but it is um, one of the housing types. It's congregate care, um, assisted living. One of them is supportive housing. <coughs> so the, the original request from the applicant was R2. So that condition basically was prohibiting all the uses in R2 other than detached houses. Um, and then at some point they revised the request to R4, but didn't update the language of that condition. So one of my recommendations was, this list reflects R2, do you want to add stuff from R4? I even said R2 still. Um, so they just added basically the difference between R2 and R4 is a handful of stuff, which I think must include supportive. And so they added that among all the other stuff just to fully account for the R4 nature of the request. If that made sense. Yeah. 
have a question for staff. Is that okay? Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I have more comments on the supportive housing, but I want <clears throat> to clarify that um, is the updated definitions to the condition, is that considered an offered condition? Yes, ma'am. So we cannot now go back and ask for the pedestrian because they added little nits to <laughs> um, excluded. That is true. I think this opens up a huge Pandora's box for um, applicants to just make little definitional changes and push and uh, then not allow us. I think it, it creates a real big issue here. Yeah. Uh, so, so not to editorialize too much, um, and I'll wait for Travis to beep the button at me, but the question before in the previous case was, you know, what can we do in the recommendation? Um, and so in that case, you did choose to recommend approval with suggestions. Um, it's my understanding you could do the opposite and recommend denial unless they do something. Um, so the certified recommendation can go either way. And so if, if there was a real strong, if, if someone wanted to make the motion, you know, we like this case except what's missing something, that is the, there are two avenues open to you, um, depending on how strongly you feel about what's missing, I think. I don't know if. Well, and also, could these changes be um, considered technical changes that were made? No, so they've already submitted the condition changes to staff. And so I, I've heard the comment a couple times, I understand um, the perception or I understand the perspective. I'll say this, you know, the intention behind the change to the code was to allow for um, an adequate process, but an expedient process, um, realizing the amount of work that you have to deal with. You know, you have a, a very large pending list of zoning cases that you need to get through. So the code was changed in such a way to allow for an efficient uh, streamlined process for rezoning. Um, it's incumbent upon the, the Planning Commission to, to really soak in everything that you hear at the first point of discussion. I, I realize that that might seem overwhelming because staff is producing fairly large staff reports for multiple cases. You know, today you've got 10 staff reports on your agenda and each of the staff reports is you know, 20, 30 pages long. So I realize and recognize that's a lot of information for you to digest, but the reports are structured in such a way as to highlight issues. And that's done within the first few pages of each staff report. Uh, so the intention is that through discussion and through feedback you hear from the public, those items are highlighted and there's an opportunity for the applicant to address those through conditions. Now, as Ira said, there might be an instance where an applicant decides not to address an outstanding issue, and that's okay. Uh, you still have the ability to recommend denial of the, of the request and specify why you've done so. And in doing so, I think that's a fairly powerful message to the city council in stating exactly what you see as a shortcoming with the case. But just to clarify, if the changes here, if they had been made later, could they have been considered technical changes only? Um, I, I don't know that I grasp the details of the changes that have happened. So potentially, you know, if, it, if the changes didn't um, alter the outcome of the condition and we're just clarifying language, that's, that's possible. And if, as long as I've got the microphone swung in front of my face, I'll spend a little bit more time on the, the condition that the applicant considered for the connection. So we did have a fair amount of discussion and uh, we'll admit that the applicant identified a number of, of different challenges with the site that uh, make it fairly difficult to develop, which I, I think staff appreciates. Uh, there's a, a stream buffer, there's an unusual shape to the site, there's topographic challenges that they are all dealing with. Um, as we looked at the connecting, um, pedestrian connection to Strickland Road, the applicant was trying to balance a, a number of different things. One was consistency or compliance with the forestation standards that state that uh, you can't create, um, in simple terms, small areas of forestation. You have to have at least 20% of your forest air, forested area as contiguous. Uh, they were also trying to deal with the topographic challenges they had at Strickland Road. So walking through each one of those challenges uh, proved that, that they could not, uh, with the site design they've showed you, gain compliance with that. Now, again, that's above and beyond what's required in the code, so they were, they were trying to offer a condition that's not normally required. Um, they, 
as we talked about, there, there might still be an opportunity for them to explore that. Um, I didn't, we had a conversation about uh, whether or not it was an ADA accessible connection or not. We've seen conditions that have done that in the past. Uh, so there, there still are other opportunities that they could uh, see if through engineering work with the code standards in place. Thank, uh, thanks, Travis. Um, I know we're kind of, kind of getting into details and site planning at, at this stage, and, and I appreciate the applicant's efforts to demonstrate the constraints of the site. I still think connectivity is extremely important for this. Um, based on the diagram, how far away were we from the 20% with that, with that line? Is the line creating the issue, or is it the way that's arranged in the division? I ask that because there could be a different arrangement and nothing against the engineers, but there could be an opportunity for them to, to demonstrate that it's 20% and that's still right. maintain a c connectivity. So I think if we proceed without some connection acceptance on that, I think we're missing out an opportunity for the... Yeah, and the you raise a, a good point. Um, I, I would defer to the applicant in answering, you know, how close they were if there's a different alignment that's possible. Hi. I'm Emily Rothrock. I'm the landscape architect from ESP Associates. I'm going to try to share a couple points um, on this. We've gone pretty far into design at this rezoning stage, so I appreciate your recognition of that. We have have a couple things to balance here. One is TCA. We're on a thoroughfare. We've got an acreage and an area and a linear footage to meet there. We've also talked with Parks and Rec. We have um, ADA accessibility standards, but they're above the normal requirements, meaning that we have increased slopes and options for rest areas. We took a look at that. Um, as we reach those limits, we've got really big impact to this tree safe area. So we've taken some consideration and studied that. I think in order to make that tree area conforming, we need about, it's between a half and um, another total acre. And so as we looped that around and brought that up more towards Strickland Road or pulled it back down, we were crossing wetlands, we were taking out a lot more trees, and we, without really designing this and engineering this, it's really difficult to say where we land. So I think um, there's a lot of design opportunity. I think the other thing to note is that some of the site constraints, including above 30% slopes, retaining walls adjacent, um, utility boxes where you know our pedestrian connection is proposed to connect, those are all elements we would need to study at a site plan level and really get into the engineering of. And then stormwater calculations and any of that impervious impact would need to be mitigated. Thank you. Can can somebody pull that exhibit back up with the proposed connection they presented? I'm just going to offer that we have a pretty heavy agenda, so we should probably keep pushing along. Um, okay. Can I? I went back to my notes from this last meeting, and I had a question. Um, I think Mr. Emman mentioned the block perimeter, and I have notes that they're meeting block perimeter on this, correct? That's not a condition. The applicant has not offered a condition, and I believe you're correct that at this point, staff believes there's a path to uh, compliance. I'd welcome Jason Myers to correct me if I'm wrong. He's not getting up, so I guess he's, you're He's right. on the other side of the room. I'll say they, there's nothing in the case that exempts them from block perimeter. So they either qualify for one of the exemptions in the code, right. or they have to meet it. Okay. I think and they I, will tell you they think they qualify for an exemption. Uh, that's Staff what will I say recall. we're not prepared to tell you one way or the other because we don't have a site plan. But I just wanted to confirm that. Um, the other question, and um, Chair Lantman's probably going to get on me because I know we've got to move forward, but I am curious about the construction traffic. I mean, I've got construction traffic in my neighborhood as well, and I know that there are requirements that are or there are requirements that are necessary, but the enforcement of those sometimes is lacking. And this is tucked in back there. I'm fine with the plan. I'm actually okay. I understand the the challenges with that connection. I'm personally 
okay with where we are on that. I'm, I'm in support of this. I'm just curious about, um, <clears throat> maybe we don't need to get into it, but I would be concerned about the construction traffic. So let's not take up any more time on that, uh, but I'm in support of this project. If I may selfishly just, um, Ira, um, I'm, I personally, the supportive housing definition, I looked it up um, in the code and I feel like it communicates just the wrong message um, to eliminate that from any sort of site plan. Um, personally, I mean, I've, I felt like, I mean, if supportive housing is defined as a business, I think, but um, the way it's defined is it could provide um, some help uh, in the community, so um, that was just the thought that I had. I don't like how that was added at all, at all. Um, we have one more comment. Is it? 13028 Saxon Way, I'm a resident. I come here as a very concerned mother. Saxon Way is very narrow street, a very, very narrow street. We just had a storm last week and hit one of the houses there were trucks taking, moving that tree, we couldn't even get out of Saxon Way. I invite you guys to analyze the width of Saxon because that's gonna be a danger for the kids of the neighborhood. I don't think the walkway would satisfy our concerns as neighbors. We don't mind about progress, but we do want a connection to Strickland Road because we are concerned families about the safety of our kids because Saxon Way is very, very narrow. Thank you, I appreciate Thank that. You. Um, I know this particular site has its challenges and um, uh, so with that, I would like to um, entertain a motion from a uh, commissioner. Um, um, I don't wanna be, um, ignore the last comment. I'm not sure where she went, but um, I did look, there are, there are sidewalks along there. So um, I would like to, uh, move to recommend adoption of the proposed consistency statement dated May 10th, 2022, contained in the agenda materials, and to recommend approval of the zoning amendment after considering the policies, maps, and other materials included as part of the comprehensive plan. I believe this zoning amendment is consistent with the comprehensive plan and consistent with the future land use map. The action taken is reasonable and in the public interest because it meets policies LU 8.10 infill development, LU 8.12 infill compatibility, and UD 1.10 frontage. Commissioner O'Haver has offered a motion to recommend approval of, do I have a second? Second from Commissioner Dantel. Okay, all in favor of those, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. Um, all opposed? Thank you. The motion passes 6-0. Uh, thank you again to everyone who spoke um, on that case. Um, I would ask for the uh, remainder of our time here if um, uh, speakers are kind of noting their time to come up and speak, that they come and speak during that time. And please don't just walk up to the podium and start talking. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to case number Z8721. This request was discussed at the April 12th meeting where the commission was asked, where the commission asked the applicant to consider conditions related to the comprehensive plan policy. I'd like to ask from an update from staff focusing on any new information. Good morning. Um, the case was deferred on April 12th to allow the applicant to consider a uh, revised conditions to address inconsistency with uh, policy DT 1.17. Uh, they have submitted a condition, so I'll just go kind of straight to that and uh, answer any questions you might have afterwards. Um, so the applicant submitted a condition that would re require at least one public art installation of a minimum size, um, which uh, meets the consistency with the pol with policy DT 1.17 um, in uh, public art is one of those specific items mentioned um, that would sort of meet that consistency with the policy. Um, there are no inconsistent policies um, and the deadline for action is June 11th. And happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you. We have already received an applicant presentation and heard from members of the public. Are there members of the public here to speak on this case today? Seeing none, um, 
do, do we want to hear from the applicant again with updates? I just, I went back to my notes and I want to thank them because that was my single concern. Uh, from my notes before, there was no neighborhood opposition. Uh, and just again, when we heard the first case, this is an example where we've asked for and the applicants provided it. So thank you for that. Unless there are any other comments or questions, I'm ready to make a recommendation. Go ahead. Thanks, Chair Lemon. Um, quick question for staff. What, it, it does, I tried to look it up, I couldn't find it. What is the, it says minimum size. What does that mean? What is that definition? I'm sure I can go back and look at the exact language. Give me one minute. Just from my knowledge. So um, if the public art amenity is a mural, it's a uh, minimum of, of 120 square feet in area. And if it's a three-dimensional installu installation, it is uh, at least 10 feet in height, not including any base or pedestal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm personally I'm with uh, Commissioner O'Haver as well that this was an ask. And um, thank you for, for adding it. We appreciate those opportunities. With that, I would like to, if there's no additional questions, I'd like to off ask if anyone has a motion. Yeah, um, I move to recommend adoption of the proposed consistency statement dated May 10, 2022, contained in, contained in the agenda materials and to recommend approval of the zoning amendment. After consider considering the policies, maps, and other materials, um, this plan is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the future land use map. And I believe it should be approved action taken is reasonable and in the public interest um, because of a number of policies. I'll start with the one they added, DT 1.1, seven high density public realm amenities, UD 7.3 design guidelines, H 1.8 zoning for housing, and um, LU 4.7 capitalization, capitalizing on transit access. Thank you. Commissioner O'Haver has offered a motion to recommend approval. Do I have a second? Second. Commissioner Raines has seconded the motion. All in the favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, please raise your hand. Okay, the motion passes 6-0. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Can now, I ask a quick, quick oh. question for staff? When we are um, approving or adopting an approve, approved consistency statement, do we need to also read it out? You can just reference the material in the backup. Unless you want to change. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Uh, moving to case number Z422. This request was placed on a previous agenda but was not discussed. I understand that the applicant may not be available this morning and has asked for a deferral. Ira Mabel. Yes, ma'am. That is true. Great. Um, so I will say, I'll skip to my last slide. If you'd like to hear me talk, I can I'd gladly do it. I would say the applicant, um, yeah, last minute could not attend. So your deadline is June 25th. There are still two meetings, regular scheduled meetings in that time, okay. if you'd like to defer to a date certain. Um, I believe the applicant would like just the, the till the next meeting. Um, I did hear from uh, the most, uh, a neighbor, neighboring property owner who's, I think, been pretty active in the negotiations that he would not be able to attend until the June 14th. But that would leave you very little time if you wanted to discuss the case and bring it back. Um, so it's really up to you if you want to pick a is date. Is the person uh, here to speak on behalf of the case? Is it here? Is they are they here? Um, no. In opposition. Sorry. In opposition. Sorry, I just spoke. Is it? I'm the one that can't be in the next meeting. Mr. Denny. Yeah. Um, so I believe he's had some email communications. It really is your, you know, prerogative to. You could def defer till May 24th, and if you need the 14th. I believe he submitted written materials. Um, you could also hear from him today, I suppose, if you'd like to spend the time on it. Okay. The applicant's the, No, the applicant is not here. Um, I'm going to just ask a question of Travis. Um, so I assume, I do want to respect people who do show up. Um, uh, so what I'm thinking is, is that we're going to have to hear the staff presentation and then um, we would hear the, um, since the applicant's not here, we would skip that part and hear from members of the public. Um, actually, what I would suggest is that you just defer 
this item out of hand um, just because when you open up the public hearing you want it, the applicant to be available to make a presentation at the sure. same time that someone else might like to speak on the on the case so okay. um, just deferring it to another date I think would be appropriate okay but we can still hear from the public sure if you'd like to hear general comments right now that's fine okay I, I think that it would be appropriate if you're okay with coming up and just I'm going to limit this to five minutes, if that's OK, um, for, for public comment. And, and I also uh, Go ahead and make your way to the, yeah, thank you. Sorry, can I ask a, just. I didn't expect to, to speak today. Uh, I just didn't want to miss in case you called. We don't it, want to miss your comments either. So is it possible for us to, get, to hear from everybody on a date where everyone can make it? rather than the very next meeting or but the very like next meeting we don't have any opportunities to ask for conditions because uh, it would go then straight to the last meeting so that's my interpretation oh i see we only have one meeting where but we can ask for an extension I, I think there's ample time here if you wanted to hear the case on may 24 i understand the challenge is that the gentleman that's getting ready to speak can't be in attendance at that meeting um if in Instead, you'd like to defer this case to June 14th. Um, Ira, is there time to submit conditions and come back for the June 25th meeting or no? No, the, the next meeting after that is after the 25th. I okay. Think, so the 14th is the last regular Understood. schedule. Thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. Why, why, why couldn't the applicant be here? Applicants unavailable today. Yeah. I don't I want would to hear the your, case. You're wanting to hear five minutes on just public comment generally. Um, yes, and then uh, move this to the May 24th okay. date. I appreciate you being here today. Go ahead and make your comments, and um, we will uh, uh, hear the full case on the 24th. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Denny, uh, 626 Dorothea Drive, uh, directly adjacent to 611 West South Street on the south side. I uh, just want to make a few quick points. Um, uh, you're you're going to hear that there are some consistencies uh, which I disagree with, quite honestly, and I'm going to run through why I believe they're, they're not consistent. Uh, so just real quickly, only 601 is currently in X4. It was in X3 two years ago. Two years ago, the applicant uh, asked for in X4. They got it. There was no issue with that. Um, they're currently seeking, actually, I'm just going to skip because uh, this is, um, okay, so 601, uh, the, the staff report says that it is consistent with the future land use map, uh, and I'm, I'm saying that it's not because it says uh, this should be medium density, uh, and medium density is defined as RX zoning with three or four story height limit, and they're asking for seven. Uh, 601, oh, excuse me, 611, I'm going to skip that one too, it's, it's all in your packet. Um, the TOD is the biggest issue here. The addition of the TOD removes the transition yard, uh, and that means that this four-story apartment building, uh, which we're not opposed to, uh, what we're opposed to is the fact that with the TOD, it could then be built 10 feet from our property line. Uh, without the TOD, it would have to be 50 feet from our property line. Uh, I'll go on the record as saying that uh, Mac, Paul, and I are in constant communication. We're having very good conversations. Uh, we're supportive of this development. Uh, but the, the, the setback is the biggest issue for us on 611. Um, the, the, the staff report says it is consistent with future land use map. Future land use map actually says it's moderate residential, which says 14 units per acre. Applicant is seeking more than 100 units per acre. Um, it says that R6, R10, and Rx, as long as Rx is conditioned to limit density, is appropriate. This Rx. Uh, is seeking to maximize density, quite honestly, in, in my opinion. We can use every square inch of the, of the land possible. Um, we agree with the city report uh, that it is inconsistent with policy LU 5.1. We agree with the city report that it is inconsistent with policy LU 8.12. Uh, the city staff report says that it is consistent with policy LU 810, uh, but we disagree um, based on the underlying copy because uh, such development should complement the established character of the area and should not create sharp changes in the physical development pattern, uh, but the physical development pattern is one story 
all around it, all around it. Um, we disagree uh, with the staff report that policy LU 5.4 is consistent. We believe it's inconsistent uh, because low to medium density residential should serve as transitional densities between lower density neighborhoods, us, and more intensive commercial uses. Uh, collectively, these are not low, moderate, or either medium density, uh, nor do they appropriately transition to the single family homes to the south of the, of the properties. Uh, we disagree uh, with uh, the buffering requirements policy. We believe it's inconsistent, uh, primarily because of that TOD issue. Uh, the TOD eliminates transition zone B, uh, which should provide us an additional 50 feet, of, excuse me, an additional 40 feet of buffer. Uh, we're going to get 10, uh, but we believe that 50 is the appropriate when you go from mixed use to single family residential. Uh, downtown edges, uh, we believe that this is um, inconsistent. Um, appropriate transition and heightened scale should be provided between central business district and adjacent residential. Uh, this seven story building would be taller by more than double of anything in 700 feet in any direction. Uh, and a 50 foot tall building sitting 10 feet from the property line of six single family homes, uh, we believe is not an appropriate transition. Uh, downtown transi transition areas, um, I'm, I'm running out of time, but you'll see if we believe that if staff believes policies UL 51 and UL 8.12 are inconsistent, then this policy is too, uh, as written. Um, you're going to hear about uh, station areas uh, and height around station areas of, of new transit and BRT, uh, where it could be up to 12 uh, stories. We don't argue with that, but it also very clearly says with transitions down to three to four stories, uh, and there's also a very clear thing about edge areas. Uh, lots more in this presentation. Uh, I've spoken with several of you, um, and I appreciate your time very much. Uh, and I probably am going to do everything I can to be back and, and finish this presentation. Great. Appreciate that. Um, uh, and and I, I'm representing um, all of the, the single family homes behind the property. Uh, and so I, I'm grateful for your time. Okay, great. Um, that was actually far more sophisticated of a presentation from the public than I was anticipating. There's a lot more. Um, so what I, um, you've submitted this, have you submitted this? Yes. Okay. And so the, I'm assuming the applicant has received a copy of this as well. Is that correct? Uh, Ira, go ahead. Ira. Uh, I, I have not sent it to Mac. I know they have been in discussion. Okay. I don't know about this particular. What I will do since this is a bit unusual, um, and you're hearing part of the app comments yeah. now. I will include this presentation in the backup for the 24th. Thank you. Just for your, if you want to look at it again or to remind you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. That will be helpful. Yeah. All right. Thank Chair, you very much for your time. Chair Lamb, sorry. Um, can I ask a, again, and um, Mr. Denny's added a lot of technical stuff, which again, there's, it's good stuff. Not to put more work on staff, but when you send that out, can you try to address some of the concerns and say, Here's where the here's where the breakdown is because there's a lot of technical stuff in here, which mm -hmm. kudos to the neighborhood for for getting engaged to this level. But I'll have a lot of questions if they're not already answered. Yes, sir. I will add some extra context. Sorry to ask you to do that. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. So uh, the. Case uh, Z422 will be deferred to the May 24th meeting. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on to case number Z1322. This request appeared on the last planning commission agenda but was not discussed. I would like to ask for a presentation from staff. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, JP Mansoff. Uh, this is rezoning case Z1322. It's a request to rezone just over half an acre from R4 to OX3 and your planning commission deadline is June 25th. Uh, zoning in the area is predominantly residential to the east of Creedmoor Road. There's a large uh, air, contiguous area zoned R4, and then to the west of Creedmoor and along Creedmoor is generally uh, mixed use zoning. Here's a aerial of the site. Um, so you can see that along, it's located all along Creedmoor Road. 
Um, there's that large, low-scale residential area to the east. Um, to the west is the Mariners Crossing Apartments. And uh, south of uh, Millbrook on Creedmoor is the Creedmoor Crossings Shopping Center. Here's a couple of views um, looking at the site. So just showing that there's currently a detached uh, single-family home on the site. Um, this is a general use case, so no zoning conditions have been offered. Um, with this request, the residential density or allowed residential density will increase um, the uh, office and retail square, square footage, which previously weren't allowed under the residential zoning, would also um, increase with the request. Um, the site uh, has a higher walk score than average, uh, I imagine likely due to the shopping center um, nearby, um, lower bike score than the city average, and similar transit and uh, transportation costs and job proximity to um, the, the city averages. There's currently uh, Route 34 serving Creedmoor Road with a stop um, just north of the site um, going northbound and then the southbound site uh, across the street. Um, we'll note that to reach that southbound site, you would have to um, kind of walk south to Millbrook, cross there, and then walk back up if you um, aren't looking at jaywalking there. So, uh, The request would add to the housing supply, um, does not include any subsidized units, um, but it would permit a wider variety of housing types, allow smaller units and smaller lots than the citywide average, and it is within walking distance of a transit stop. Uh, the site, or the census tract that the site is in generally has a higher life expectancy than the city average, um, lower percentage of people of color, um, low income population, and ling linguistically isolated population, so lower percentage in, in all of those categories. The requested OX district is consistent with the uh, office and residential mixed use uh, future land use designation that's on the site. Uh, and there's no urban form designation, um, so no frontage is included in the request. It is consistent overall with the comprehensive plan and with the future land use map, uh, consistent with policies regarding consistency with the future land use map, um, transition of density and um, complementary land uses to the residential districts um, consistent with policies rega uh, regarding increasing housing uh, types and um, units and also consistent um, with the inclusion of the OX district um, with the policy regarding ancillary retail uses so it would limit um, the scale of, of allowed retail uses um, to the point that's compatible with sort of adjacent residential uses. Uh, no inconsistent policies were identified uh, and no outstanding issues in your deadline for action is June 25th with a couple of meetings listed there before that deadline. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. All right, with that we have heard from staff. Next I'd like to hear from the applicant. The applicant has a total of 10 minutes to speak. Thank you. I'm Alexis Schrager. I'm the owner of property 5810 Creedmoor Road. Um, the intent, it, there is currently um, existing home on site. It wasn't occupied for the last 10 years, where the, the intent is to keep the house, to split into duplex upstairs and um, add additional space in the back for two more units, hopefully one office and one another rental space, uh, residential rental. Um, again, the intent is to keep the house, possibly add um, its um, half an acre lot, so maybe add another um, rental space in the back, um, depending on the <coughs> site design, and um, because it's a sloped um, lot, so we have to do the drainage issue and um, uh, water. but. Um, other than that, um, I'm here to answer questions. Great, thank you. All right, uh, next I would like to hear from those from the public who may be in opposition, or any in favor, actually, if they wanted to speak before, okay. All right, I would like now to 
allow for questions and comments from commissioners. Does anyone have any questions or comments? I assume this was old business because we didn't get to it. Go ahead, Dean, somebody else. All right, I'll go again. Um, I move to recommend adoption of the proposed consistency statement dated May 10, 2022, contained in the agenda materials, recommend approval of the zoning amendment for zoning case Z1322. I will not go into any of the policies. Ms. Miller. <laughs> Second. Thank you. Commissioner O'Haver has offered a motion to recommend approval, and Commissioner Miller has seconded the motion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. All of those opposed, please raise your hand. Seeing none, the motion passes six to zero. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on to new business. There are five items listed under the new business portion of the agenda. These requests have not appeared on the previous Planning Commission agenda, and we will hear from here a full staff presentation and applicant presentation. Case number CP1421. This is a request to amend compre the comprehensive plan. The request would modify the street plan map inserted policy language re related to bus rapid transit. The request has not been previously discussed. I would like to ask for the staff presentation from John Agagnos. This is a staff initiated, initiated request, so the city is the applicant. Thank you, good morning. I am John Agnos from Planning and Development. Uh, so this comprehensive plan amendment is intended to designate busway streets on the uh, MAP T1 street plan of the 2030 comprehensive plan. This is based on the wake transit plan proposals for bus rapid transit service on four quarters around downtown Raleigh, though this amendment only applies to the first three quarters that are in design processes to actually construct the BRT service. Uh, and those quarters are Newburn Avenue, South Wilmington Street, and Western Boulevard. And you may remember recently reviewing the text change to create these street cross sections, TC-4-21. Uh, and so basically this is a follow-up to that action or that item to take viewed by the city council to be added to the unified development ordinance, taking those cross sections and applying them on the street plan map, which then carries legal weight in private development through the unified development ordinance. Uh, but a little bit more background. So the, the BRT design process is ongoing and for Newburn is pretty much complete. So my understanding of the Newburn design process is they have completed the engineering design and have moved into right of way acquisition. Western is approaching the 30% design mark and Southern uh, is in the earliest stages of that process, but imminent uh, design work being done for uh, the BRT quarters. And so this is basically, this comprehensive plan amendment is reinforcing that. So the city needs to make sure that our policy documents are aligned with the activity that we're doing on the ground. Um, it, additionally, there are a number of other processes that will follow this or are being done in parallel with this. So the Western Boulevard Quarter Study, which you also have seen in the last few months, uh, stationary planning for Newburn. There is also gonna be stationary planning processes for Western Boulevard and South Wilmington Street to apply land use visions for those areas. Uh, to be integrated with the transportation planning, and then the transit overlay district mapping rezoning, which you are currently reviewing in the Committee of the Whole. So uh, what these proposals actually do, number one, as I said, reinforce the activity that the city is pursuing, pursuing through the design and construction of the BRT service on these corridors uh, to allow bus rapid transit to have the appropriate dedicated bus lanes as well as areas for the station platforms to be constructed. Uh, the other thing that these proposals do, and we have these maps for your reference, is that if there is private development in the interim between when the city is conducting the design process and when the city actually begins construction of these new corridors, the private development uh, will have this street section applied to it so that the any new development would be required to dedicate the appropriate amount of right-of-way and potentially, uh, depending on the context, 
pro provide streetscape improvements related to the specific development. Uh, so it's basically kind of a twofold impact of, of these conference plan amendments to reinforce the city activity and also to ensure that private development activity is not going to conflict with the city activity. Uh, and so the amendment is consistent with the comprehensive plan related to policies about dedicating right-of-way or establishing the types of streets or uh, scope of right-of-way that will be needed for new public streets in the future. And there are no inconsistent policies. Right, I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Now I'd like to ask if there's anyone here who is from the public who is here to speak in opposition of this request. Yes, sir, thank you. Oh yes, thank you. And if there's anybody else uh, here to speak in opposition, um, please feel free to make your way towards the mic. Uh, my name is Richard Taylor. I own a business at 3705 Newburn Avenue and Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Richard Taylor. I own a business, Taylor's Nursery, 3705 Newburn Avenue. And I'd like to go on record as saying I support bus, and I, there's a bus stop in front of our office. We see it on a daily basis. It's a good thing the city needs. It should be expanded. I'm 100% in favor of it. Uh, the bus station, the bus station, or the bus way, I think, whatever they call it, is, uh, it's a good thing. Uh, where it's currently designed, uh, and you can look at the overlay maps, uh, the construction process takes about 50% of a parking lot out. It's about one truck length apart. Our business deals with trucks, trailers coming in and out on a daily basis, up to 100 a day sometimes. So we've got a traffic flow that goes through there. So uh, this, the construction and the permanent easement and there were the they will take will cause a choke point there. Uh, all I've asked is for the design process to move the bus stop about a 50 feet, a little bit less or more, about a, a bus length to the east. Uh, this would allow us to change our interior design so we could accommodate parking. Currently, the where it is uh, is sandwiched between a building and the parking lot, so I don't have anywhere to go but if it was moved east, even just a couple of bus lengths, then that would allow the, uh, the traffic flow through our parking lot. Uh, and this would, to me, it'd be a little, very manageable conflict. Uh, if you look across the street at the plan, the eastbound lane, the bus stop was moved to the west, probably a couple hundred feet. All I'm asking is for the bus stop to be moved to the west, uh, I mean to the east, uh, just enough so that we can accommodate a traffic flow through there. By accommodating the traffic flow, it'll prevent a bottleneck which will create blocked uh, problems of incoming traffic, uh, which would create a safety issue. So this will allow us to maintain operations as normal, as safe. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, that was good feedback, thank you. Um, okay. Anyone else in opposition with this case? Okay, I would like to now allow for questions and comments from the commissioners. Does anyone have any questions or comments? I have a question for staff. If um, you could address Mr. Taylor's comments, um, obviously trying to figure out the exact placement of each of these um, stops is going to be something that you have to look at, at for each um, property owner. Could you talk about when or how that's um, included in the process for designing these bus stops? Yeah, the design process, so Mr. Taylor's property is on Newburn Avenue, the north side, uh, just east of Trawick Road. The design process is, in some instances, prevented from directly contacting property owners because of federal guidelines about the use of federal grant money until they reach the right-of-way acquisition stage. And so that's where we are now. Uh, and so Mr. Taylor has been in touch with the project manager for the BRT design project. And my understanding is that the discussion of the right-of-way acquisition related to the station that is proposed at his property is ongoing and that that is, that is a 
a conversation that is basically between Mr. Taylor, uh, the the project manager for that project, and and the city's real estate division. Uh, so this particular amendment is not going to change the outcome of that conversation. Um, but I will say that that station location has been part of the design process uh, for many months now. And if Jason wants to add details about that. I'm Jason Myers in transportation. John addressed most of what I was going to say, but I want to add one piece of context to this. On the current Newburn project that, that is in right-of-way acquisition does not include a busway outside of or beyond Sunnybrook Road. So I'm going to draw on here. Um, I think it's about this location in dedicated transit lanes as a part of the project the city is in right-of-way acquisition for right now. Outside of this distance, that is mixed traffic, buses mixed in with all other traffic um, as a way to extend that service a little bit further without having to, to invest quite as much resources and basically was a way for our transit planners to extend the, improve, the, the benefit of the bus rapid transit investments at the cost that the Wake Transit Plan could support in the timeline that, that we wanted to, to get that work done. What this, what this um, comprehensive plan amendment along with TC4 helps allow is that when property that is in this area redevelops, it preserves the right of way for us to put that busway in in the future and, and potentially in an incremental way um, and, and helps preserve that corridor. It does not impact Mr. Taylor's um, nursery unless he were to develop that. If he were to subdivide and cease operations as a nursery, then the resulting subdivision would dedicate more right of way um, and, and the, the issues that he's having with the, and, and I'm ever so slightly aware that there's a discussion, I don't know the particulars of it, nor do I know much about the site design, so I can't answer questions about that. Um, but the, the issue he was addressing seemed to be mostly about the BRT design that he's in negotiations with and not about this comprehensive plan amendment. Thank you, and with the right-of-way acquisition process, um, is there compensation for the private property owners? Yes, yes, of course. So if this were to impact a business in a, in a more impactful way, then presumably w would that um, impact on the negative impact on that business have to be compensated for? Yes. So it would sort of be in, is it the city that's paying for this the so right away? Right now, the city and the Wake Transit Plan as a tax district and the federal government are paying, you know, three reimbursement for right-of-way being procured to build the BRT service in the project that was mentioned. If there were a site plan trigger to dedicate right-of-way later because of this comp plan amendment and whether it's with Mr. Taylor's property or somebody else's property, there's there's a test that we have to do about what's proportional and, and there's often re right away reimbursements for wider street sections. So as a for instance, we do this a lot of places now where, where there may be a four lane divide and mapped on our street plan through a rural area and the subdivision of that land might just build 10 houses and they're required to dedicate this extra right of way because of our comp plan. We have to pay them back for the cost of that extra right of way. The same provision might be in play along Newburn in the future through sub subdivision of this land. And there's other mechanisms to ensure proportionality as well. Thank you. So just to summarize, that it sounds like there is some portion of the process where Mr. Taylor and other individual property owners get to be involved in the design process um, however, if it turns out a bus stop would be located in a place that would have a larger negative impact on his business, he would be compensated for the larger negative impact on his business as a result. I believe, I, I am not 100% certain of this, but I believe he has an offer for the right-of-way impacts that are proposed in the project right now is in active negotiations with the project manager. And if, if, if the commission needs specific information about that, I'd have to have to refer that to uh, to my colleagues in engineering services and real estate. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Reins, did you have any questions? Sir? No. Okay, great. Great. Good job. I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Um, the street cross sections, I know we had a lot of back and forth on those, are the ones that were presented, are those the final street sections as they're, that they've been approved? Because I know we had a lot of feedback on the widths of those 
and the dimensions. And I don't remember, I don't recall where we ended up on that, but I know there, were, there was a lot of comments about that. So I'm just curious if these are the, if these are the ones that have been approved. I pulled these images from the uh, board docs agenda item for the city council public hearing for TC 421, the hearing that was deferred from April 19th to May the 17th. So uh, to my knowledge, that is, these are the, the sections that would appear on the May 17th agenda for potential final decision by the city council. So there's a, there's a chance that these may be tweaked. The city council has the authority to modify these, yes. Thank you. I have a question, a utility, overhead utility question. In, in these cross sections, and this might not be for this, this, this might be, not be the appropriate place to ask this, but is, will all overhead utilities be undergrounded as part of this process? Or, you know, it's a prettier picture without them there, but we need them for power and communication internet. So these street sections are the same behind the curb as the divided avenues um, approved as a part of TC321. Um, so this 21 and a half foot, this roadside environment here, is identical to what's in the code right now for two lane divideds, four lane divideds, um, six lane divideds, and a couple other um, par parallel parking street sections. And in, in that, we are expecting to generally try to put utilities in this three and a half foot space. Um, let me draw a utility pole there, and in some cases we'll put it there, especially depending on NCDOT clear zone requirements. I think there is the possibility, technically, to also put utilities not all at the same time, all of, you know, I realize people are seeing all these poles and thinking we're going to put utilities in all of them simultaneously to put them in that median um, space, but I suspect that, that the utility providers generally don't want that, and if this is an NCDOT maintained facility, NCDOT would generally not want that. So I think that the answer is that utilities will go in the same places that they will go in the existing street sections um, of the two-lane divided and four-lane divided and six-lane divided. Does that answer your question? It does. I would just note that the the roadside looks a lot more activated in these than I think currently exists in the right of way, and that may be um, unpalatable to the users of of those walkways and bikeways when utility access is needed. But also, it will also if it if it ends up in that area, then it also affects the type of tree that can go there, the canopy. The width of that, again, I, I know there was a lot of discussion about the street cross section, so I think there's maybe some more outside of this venue that we might need to attack that. Any additional questions? Okay. All right. Seeing no other comment, I'd like to entertain a motion. Go ahead. Commissioner Reigns. Thank you. Um, for zoning KC, let me sure if I read right one. CP 14 21, thank you. Um, sorry. I move to recommend adoption of the proposed consistency statement dated May 10th, 2022, contained in the agenda materials, and to recommend approval of the zoning amendment. Great, thank you. Commissioner Reigns is offered. Comprehensive plan amendment, correct. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Reigns has offered a motion to recommend approval. Do I have a second? Second. Commissioner Miller has seconded the motion. Uh, this is a comprehensive plan amendment, so there's no need for a comprehensive plan consistency statement, which I think is what you were getting at. And so all in, those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. All opposed, please raise your hand. Seeing none, the motion passes 6-0. Thank you. Just a quick clarification on that. Their comprehensive plan amendments are evaluated, you know, with consistency with other aspects of the comprehensive plan, but there's no statutory requirement that you adopt a consistency statement like there is with rezonings and text amendments. Okay. Because it's a comprehensive plan amendment, it's automatically changing something in the comprehensive plan. And so just wanted to make that clear. Thanks. If 
I can make a quick comment too, because um, you know those those dash and dotted lines are my nemesis on a lot of cases, um, and I know the city is going to have to have a super robust engagement policy because of the impacts of this. But again, I just I see now when cases come forward, we're going to have residents that are saying, "Why is this dash line the way that it is?" I just I hope we tackle that as best we can through community engagement. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to case number CP422. This is a request to amend the comprehensive plan. The request would modify the street plan map r related to Winecott Drive. I would like to ask for staff presentation from John Agnost. Good morning again. This is a comprehensive plan amendment for a proposed extension of Wincott Drive between uh, its current southern terminus and South Wilmington Street. Uh, so here you can see the general area, uh, basically a residential area on the west side of South Saunders and South Wilmington Street surrounding Peach Road and with Ily Agnes uh, providing sort of the outer perimeter. And Peach Road Park is a city park that's also within this neighborhood. Uh, so there is currently a proposed public street that would extend Wincott Drive to the inner, towards the interchange of South Saunders and South Wilmington Street. That was a product of the Southern Gateway Corridor Study uh, from about six or seven years ago. And the proposal is to remove that, that proposed segment. So part of the, uh, and this is privately initiated, this is initiated by a developer who is pursuing an affordable housing development on this property uh, on the south side of Peach Road. Uh, so the original alignment of this street as proposed in the Southern Gateway Plan and which is displayed in the area specific guidance for Southern Gateway which was appended to the 2030 Comprehensive Plan shows a different alignment from what, was, what ended up on the street plan map, map T1. And so you can see here basically this pink dotted line uh, which is then expanded on the right side of the image actually would have carried the street farther to the south before turning towards the east uh, and basically avoiding the interchange of South Saunders and South Wilmington. Uh, and so there was basically an error in transposing that between this corridor study map and the street plan map. So in the street plan, uh, the street turns to the east a, a good bit farther to the north. There's also a stream in that location and it also is shown on the street plan basically teeing into what is an elevated interchange uh, where it's almost impossible to make that street connection uh, really at all. This is the development plan that is pending uh, from the applicant. So this is, is under review, has not been approved, but this is basically one way that the applicant would potentially be able to make a street connection through this site, though not necessarily the one indicated by the street plan. Uh, and so one of the differences between what the applicant is proposing and what the street plan would require is that the street plan uh, designates this as a neighborhood street or a local street. And so that carries a specific section uh, in the same way that the busway streets that you just saw on the previous item carry a partic particular cross section which is then required during a development plan. Uh, without this street being shown on the street plan, but being retained in the area specific guidance and that is the intent and the impact of this proposed amendment would be that it would stay in the area specific guidance in the southern gateway section of the comprehensive plan. Uh, in that instance it does not carry a specific cross section and there's more leeway for the applicant and the development engineering staff at the city to agree on an adequate level of service from a new street connection. And so uh, what the applicant is proposing is a multifamily street which would have a public access easement allowing uh, travel through the site. And so that would then ultimately enable if uh, the city wanted to pursue a future project to connect that new multifamily street down to South Wilmington Street, that would, that would provide that access from Peach Road. Uh, and the other thing I'll note about the difference between having this street on the street plan and having it just be in the area specific guidance for Southern Gateway is that street plan designated streets do not offer any relief mechanism through the UDO. Uh, so you, you cannot seek a design adjustment. Uh, you really, if you cannot con construct the street as shown on the street plan, your main avenue 
is to do what this applicant has done, which is to pursue a comprehensive plan amendment. And so the staff evaluation is that this is consistent with the comprehensive plan because it would further the goal of providing a publicly accessible connection from Peach Road towards Wilmington Street, would create the opportunity for the city to complete that connection in the future, which would also enable uh, residents of this neighborhood to have closer access to future bus rapid transit service on South Wilmington Street. There is an inconsistent policy in that by removing this proposed extension, there would be a gap between the southern cul-de-sac of Wincut and, and Peach Road. The, basically, the Southern Gateway proposal does not include that segment, which was placed on the street plan. Uh, and so basically, this would enable, as proposed, the in, amendment would enable a connection south from Peach Road towards South Wilmington Street, but would no longer require that that extension uh, occur on the north side of Peach Road between Peach Road and Wincut Drive. And so that creates a gap in the network. Uh, so that's my presentation. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Next, I would like to hear from the applicant and those in favor. Uh, you have 10 minutes to speak. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and Planning Commission members. My name is Beth Trejos. I'm an attorney with Nelson Mullins, 4140 Park Lake Avenue. Um, I'm here today on behalf of Oppidan to request the comp plan amendment that Mr. Anagnos so ably and thoroughly described. Thank you for your, your presentation. I do have with me a team uh, uh, you know, to answer any questions you have. I have Noah Wagner and Tim Brent with Oppidan, as well as Shane Leathers and Ryan Fisher with BGE, the engineers for the project. So any of those folks are available to answer questions that you might have. Um, I'll try not to repeat uh, what, what John said to you, um, but uh, just tell you that uh, we have taken up a lot of uh, Mr. York and Ms. Hill's time in the city attorney's office as we tried to figure out how to uh, move it, through this process, as John said, this is not something that can be uh, a design adjustment can be can be given for. Uh, it, it it turns out that this is the only way <laughs> that we can can change the uh, type of street requirement and the specific location shown in the street plan, which, as you heard, doesn't comply or comport with the Southern Gateway plan. Um, so, so you know, we are hoping that you will grant this amendment to allow us flexibility to develop this 119-unit affordable housing project. Um, I, I would share with you um, that the version of the ASR that's pending that, that John had in the PowerPoint is not the very latest version. Uh, we've been working very closely with your transportation staff, with Mr. Myers, in fact. Um, and so the very latest version um, shows multifamily streets with, with, with two stubs. If, if it's appropriate, I have copies I can share with you. Um, if, is that, I can pass them up. just so you have the, the latest um, information. Um, but I guess with that, I will, I will um, ask you to, to please approve this comp plan amendment, and our team is here to answer any questions that you might have. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Now I'd like to uh, see if there's any comments or questions from the public. Anyone opposed to this development? Okay. Thank you. Seeing no other comment, um, I'd like to ask uh, for questions and comments from commissioners. Does anyone have any questions or comments? So, um, to confirm, the, the, the proposed site plan that's in review will still allow the city to tie into Wilmington Street. I think you said that, correct? Which is the plan. Yes, it would provide public access through the development site uh, with a stub at the south end. Okay. And the, the new plan, as Ms. Trejos mentioned, uh, offers a, a secondary stub, which I think is great. And just to go back to my previous comment, um, this is one of those cases where I'm, I'm totally in favor of removing that dash line. Me too. Thank you. Any other comments here? Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, seeing no other comment, I'd like to entertain a motion. 
Um, I don't see in the back. Let me so try and pull the plan one. amendment too, so we don't have to. You have can just say motion to approve. I make a motion to approve CP four twenty two. Great, Commissioner O'Haver has offered a motion to approve. Do second. I have, Commissioner Miller has a second. All right, all in the favor of those, please raise your hand. Great, thank you. All in opposed. Seeing none. The motion passes six zero. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Moving to case number Z6621. This request has not previously been discussed. I would like to ask for a staff presentation from Don Belk. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, this case, Z6621, is uh, at 3900 Mitchell Mill Road, and it is a request to rezone two acres of a 3.87 acre parcel from R4 to CX3 with conditions. Your deadline for this rec a recommendation in this case is July 9th. As you see, the zoning in the area is predominantly R4 with CX3 to the east. Here's an aerial view. Um, the commercial area, that comprises the um, Wake Crossroads area, which is, uh, includes area-specific guidance in Section 16 of the Comprehensive Plan. Wake Crossroads is um, considered a historic crossroads community. It was originally inventoried in the uh, 1990 Wake County Survey. Uh, and uh, still a variety of traditional uh, commercial uses there uh, that have evolved over time. Uh, I point out the institutional use to the north, the Wake Crossroads Baptist Church. Uh, that is the, uh, one of the largest and the oldest Baptist Church in Wake County. Uh, I believe it started in the late 18th century. Uh, you can see the predominance of low-scale residential in this uh, general area. A oh, close up of the site, clear uh, the Wake Crossroads uh, Baptist Church is clearly uh, shown there. Uh, I'll also note uh, a public facilities use uh, the Wake County, I'm, I'm sorry, the City of Raleigh Fire Station uh, at the southwestern quadrant of the intersection. I wanted to point out the uh, map of greenways and floodplains uh, for this site. Uh, one of the conditions in the proposal uh, would dedicate uh, all of the floodplain area that you see uh, on this parcel as part of a, the required uh, dedication uh, of a greenway easement. In addition to the required easement, the applicant is offered to dedicate the additional floodplains. So that'll create a uh, expanded uh, open space area there that would serve this um, particular greenway corridor which does tie into the Noose River Trail. Uh, some street views, um, Mitchell Mill Road to the west uh, and to the east from the site uh, and some uh, perspectives uh, from the Waste Crossroads core area. Uh, showing those uh, variety of uses, the commercial uses, the church, uh, the fire station there, um, and also a streetscape view from Hopper Street. This is the uh, single family residential neighborhood uh, to the uh, south of the site across the uh, floodplain area. Um, the proposal uh, for commercial mixed use uh, is uh, commercial mixed use zoning would be uh, inconsistent with the future land use map designation of this area for moderate density residential. Uh, however, the applicant has offered um, conditions here to um, eliminate many of the uh, higher impact uses uh, that would be permitted in CX. As you can see, um, firstly, the apartment building type would be prohibited and also a long list of uh, uh, uses here, uh, uh, specifically some uh, retail uses that would be um, prohibited. 
Also, they uh, have proposed to limit the hours of operation of any uh, restaurant or retail sales use, except for the potential of a pharmacy um, or any retail use that sells prescription medications. Hours of operation would begin at 6 a.m. and end by 11. They would prohibit drive-throughs. And also the uh, Greenway easement dedication that I referenced earlier. Comparison of the existing zoning with the proposed. Uh, you can see, uh, again, this is for a portion of that site. Um, the density uh, could increase uh, to 42 units per acre, uh, yielding a maximum number of units of 85. Um, and this is specific. I, I should note that uh, this, it actually would be lower than this because these numbers would reflect uh, the apartment uh, building type, which is, has been prohibited by conditions. Uh, but otherwise, the zoning would allow this, uh, or it would the according to our envision analysis, um, it, this could be the entitlement under this proposal. Uh, note the setbacks. Not much change there. Um, slight reductions and the setbacks for the proposed zonings. I wanted to point out too on this one, since it is going from residential to uh, commercial mixed use, uh, note uh, the, the potential for office and retail square footage. Um, given the location of the site, it does uh, score low uh, in terms of its uh, carbon footprint, uh, lower walk score, bike score, the area is not served by transit. Therefore, it also has a lower uh, transportation cost in index, meaning transportation costs would be higher than the city average, and there would also be less access to, to jobs in this area than the city average. Uh, regarding our affordability analysis, uh, this request would add to the housing supply given the residential entitlement does not include any subsidized units. Uh, a variety of housing types would be permitted under commercial mixed use, along with smaller units and smalling, smaller lots. And as I mentioned previously, the area is not presently served by transit. This area has, uh, in general, according to our e, uh, EJ screen scan, it does show uh, a lower percentage of minority populations. It's less linguistically isolated and it has a lower population that has less than a high school education than the city average. Uh, we found no restrictive covenants or other historical covenants that restricted racial groups. As I mentioned, uh, the request is inconsistent with the future land use maps designation for moderate scale residential. And note here, this uh, the previous slides I did show the entirety of the parcel boundary. This this shows specifically that area that would be rezoned. Um, there is no urban form guidance uh, for this uh, proposal. However, I did want to note the proximity to the mixed use center, uh, the Wake Crossroads area. We do find that this proposal is consistent overall with the comprehensive plan, though it is consistent with the flume. Uh, key policies, consistent uh, compact development. This proposal would uh, provide that opportunity for a more compact development pattern and reinforcing the urban pattern that uh, emanates from Wake Crossroads currently. Um, it also, um, with the uh, added dedication of greenway and open space, uh, consistent with the buffering requirements policy, and also uh, the restrictions on commercial uses um, make it consistent with policy LU-52, managing those commercial development impacts. And also um, the protection of local streams in the Noose River by virtue of the proposed land dedication. We found no inconsistent policies. Uh, your deadline for action again, July 9th. Uh, there are three meetings coming up where uh, this uh, case could be further discussed, um, May 24th, June 7th, and June 21st. That concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Oh, I should note, uh, it flume inconsistency, uh, this proposal would require a flume amendment. It would 
uh, change uh, the flume future land use map from moderate scale residential to community mixed use and would amend the map as shown. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Next, uh, we'd like to hear from the applicant. The applicant has 10 minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello, my name is Charlotte Thaxton. I'm a native of White Cross Roads community. I was born and raised on Mitchell Mill Road and live just off of Ligon Mill now. Um, I was born and raised going to White Cross Roads Baptist Church. I would never do anything that would lessen the looks of the community. Um, I have, we have two family businesses, Ernie Lee's Service Center since 1972 and White Cross Roads Express since 2005 both on Mitchell Mill Road, half a mile from where I'm trying to get rezoned, which is family land. I'm here today because I would like to rezone a parcel at 3900 Mitchell Mill Road. My plans are to build self-storage units and have spaces to rent for parking boats, campers, and extra vehicles. Our community is steadily growing, and unfortunately, the housing development do not offer commercial parking. I see the need weekly for residents looking somewhere to park their res recreational vehicles, as well as work trucks, food trucks, while not in operation. The lot is currently vacant. The business of this nature will not disturb the neighboring residents with traffic nor noise, nor will it affect the city's proposal greenway. Instead, it will be much needed asset to the small business community. I just want to build something to help the growing of the community and give people places close by that can park their vehicles. Um, I've been told by a lot of people, because I run a convenience store, people in and out all the time having to park their vehicles 30, 45 minutes away. So I feel like it would really help the community, and I'd appreciate if I could get it resolved. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Great. I'd like to uh, open it up from the, to the public for anybody opposed to this rezoning. Uh, yes, my name. Uh, sorry. Uh, my name is Mark Slaughter. I live at 3301 Deering Drive inside McKinley Mill subdivision, um, which is behind this, this property. Um, I fully understand the desire for property owners to um, use their property as they see fit uh, for the best use. Um, however, in this instance, the applicant um, is asking to have this property zoned beyond its current designation, um, but also contrary to future land use uh, plan. Uh, I feel that both its plan use and the rezoning request will make the property inconsistent with the current state of the community and will make the area feel less cohesive. I also feel that by granting this rezoning request, it will create a uh, precedent for uh, the landowners next to and across the street from this property to request rezoning for their parcels um, as well. Uh, the owner intends to build a, a steel metal building for the purpose of storage units uh, and miscellaneous office spaces. Uh, regardless of what the landowner claims, I doubt that the residents um, are crying out for another steel metal building um, that will grace sort of the, the landscape for another 50 or so years. There's also already a pro, uh, propane storage facility um, on the property that stores old propane tanks. Um, I feel that squeezing in these storage units um, and this office space under the parcel are just going to make it visibly unappealing for the community and ultimately will not benefit the community uh, as much as the applicant is claiming. Um, as future zoning plan to this area highlights, the parcel is better suited for residential housing and granting this applicant request will uh, only encourage a shift from the uh, original planning for this area. So, that's it. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you for comments from the public and the applicant. I would like now to allow for questions and comments from commissioners. I have a, thanks, uh, Chair Layman. I have a question for, uh, for the applicant. Um, 
notice the policy UD 1.0 front edge is not included um, as part of this application. Um, I'd like to understand the reasons for that or, and if that could be an added um, condition. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to just mention that I did cite that in the report. Um, the uh, commercially zoned properties that are part of the Wake Crossroads area do have that frontage. Um, however, um, if if the frontage had been proposed um, for this site, um, it, it would it would make it more consistent with that policy. However, it would also create a gap. At such time that the entire parcel is rezoned, uh, it was the applicant's desire for this case to only rezone the two acres. But at such time the entire parcel is rezoned, then um, that would be cited as a policy that uh, uh, the frontage would be requested. And if it w was not, then it would be cited as inconsistent. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm saying it was added. At this time, we have two 30,000 gallon LP tanks. That's what the man was talking about. Um, in 1983, um, Ernie Lee's Service Center got into LP gas and we sold out in 1999. And so therefore we sold out to suburban pay, um, propane and now we just lease half of the lot, about an acre that I'm not getting rezoned and it's Yes, it's old tanks, but it's new tanks. It's what um, Suburban Propane has for their business, and they have those two storage tanks that they use all the time to deliver LP gas to residents. Okay. Thank you. Just let you know a little more about the property. Sure, thank you. Um, I just had one kind of uh, general thought. Um, the surrounding area, um, would you be open to some sort of um, buffer, tree buffer, or something that would allow um, essentially the storage of these unit, you know, the storage of the of the boats and whatnot to be kind of shielded visually from the street and neighbors? The street would be a little more difficult because there's a creek running through the back and the city has a greenway that takes up some of my property that is not usable at the back side. So between the back side, it will not interfere at all with the housing development because it was, I'm, I'm not good at short how many feet, but it's a good enough ways where you won't be able to see it through the woods in the winter time. But um, me having to move towards the street, towards Mitchell Mill Road because of the creek and the greenway, I can't really put a good buffer, but I'm born and raised there. I run business there. I don't want anything that's not going to look nice and look bad on me and my family. So I would definitely, I'm going to keep it up and, you know, I'm going to be there forever. My children are going to run it when I die, you know. So I don't want anything that's not going to look nice. Madam Chair, just to clarify, I wanted to mention that the um, we did look at the distance from the potential building envelope. Uh, again, as Ms. Thaxon mentioned, the site is considerably restrained by that floodplain. It looked to be about 180 feet uh, between that building footprint and the nearest residence. I had similar concerns to <clears throat> Commissioner Raines, um, super familiar with that portion of Mitchell Mill Road. Um, I know there's been a lot of recent improvements there. What if they were to duplicate that urban, for, urban form guidelines, what would that entail uh, to the owner? I would need to check the UDO on the specifics, but it would, um, there would be a particular build to that would be required. Um, and I think some other streetscape improvements. Uh, I would need to, to reference that, sir. Um, especially with the width of that right away there. I mean, I feel like if I understand they're only 
the applicant's only rezoning a portion of it, but once they develop it, when, when you come back and rezone the other portion, you're not going to be able to implement the design, the, 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 the form. Uh, I'm leaning towards seeing if the applicant would be willing to see if they could accommodate uh, those requirements and, and sort of start that precedent along Mitchell Mill Road because there is going to be a lot of development there over the upcoming years. What is your uh, Actually in favor, I live, work, and play in the White Cross Vote community. Uh -huh. So I'm Kim Parrott, and I live just about half a mile away from the, is that okay? Yeah, we're just catching up, that's okay. all. Uh, yeah, we've, okay, go ahead. I live about a half a mile away from the um, project, and also probably just, what, a couple of feet away, I own a business, a home uh, decor shop that's right close to that area. So I can speak on both hands as a resident and a business owner. Uh, it's something that is definitely needed in the area. It is a very strong family community. Um, I've been there probably 12 years or something like that and I've known the Lee family since my kids went to school with their kids or whatever. And so I can speak about the family and just the community part of what's there. And so I think this would be an enhancement um, to our community and especially for business owners who need need extra storage for different items that we have, you know, and being able to have inventory overflow and all that kind of thing. So I definitely need it. We, I definitely think we need it for that. And then also being a resident, my neighbor has a boat <laughs> that he needs to. <laughs> he needs it's a to beautiful boat, but it's an eyesore. So <laughs> with that, coming from both parts of it, being a resident of the community and a business owner, I think this would be a great facility. I think it's much needed. I mean, past needed. Great. Here in our community. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All I right. appreciate that feedback. All right. um, if I may, I'm just going to add a little bit of color for the applicant. Um, the applicant is requesting a CX rezoning, which is um, in our normal world, that's a very substantial rezoning. So what other developers are going to see on paper is the CX. And so that is why we're having additional discussion. Um, I'm not personally opposed. To, I think, yes, we do need boat storage. So we just have to figure out what kind of precedent we're wanting to set because other people will follow suit. And so it's not yours in particular but we've got to make sure that yours sets the right tone because a CX is a very substantial rezoning. I hope it's okay if I provide that color. So um, with that, I think um, we would, I, I, um, as, a, as a, just a chair member, um, I would like to see if the applicant would be willing to consider buffer or something else that will help um, protect visually from, and what that means is, um, and I think um, the city will be able to provide additional clarity, some sort of screening um, from, the, from the street that will um, kind of um, protect the visual aspects of your yard. I, I have every uh, faith that, yes, it's gonna look nice. However, again, we're setting a precedent, so by having a requirement that there needs to be some sort of screening. I think that that's a value add um, as we look at this growth in this area. Okay, well, my um, plans are like, when you pull in the driveway, I want to put the office buildings right here, so that's the first thing you'll see. And I have a few people that are interested in renting little spots for hairdresser, yeah. you know, things like that, and along with my office, so that would, look nice as soon as you drive in and over here I would have the storage buildings and I would put the parking for the vehicles at the back I wouldn't want them at the front um, if I need you know to put some kind of you know I could do that vinyl white fence across the front to make it look neater Yes, I was going to see, is there a way to add some of those, the, the parking location or some of those other items as conditions to this rezoning case? So for example, like your, the storage component, you're saying it's going to be in the back. We could say as part of your rezoning condition that since you're going to have the parking lot there, that the buildings for the storage are actually going to be like 150 feet from the, the, the road. I think we're going to get some help here. I guess I would just recommend from the staff report that Looking in the future, there could be a bridge. Right now, if this gets approved, there'll be a gap. But in the future, you want to connect the CX from 
east to this site. So I would recommend uh, maintaining a parking limited or keeping a parking limited front end as part of the condition for this application. So it's supporting what you just told us. You're saying that you would put the parking in front of the storage buildings, that the buildings would be more towards the back. So it's providing some sort of condition that would. I could do it either way that y'all would prefer. I personally thought that the storage buildings, when you drive in, to put a, it would be about three strips of storage buildings and then do the parking in the back because you don't want to drive down the road and look at a food truck, a boat. Right. You know, That's I right. was thinking it would look better to put the vehicles at the back of the property. Oh, I see what you're saying. I think we were thinking that it would be regular parking for someone to come in. What you're oh, saying no. is that you're describing the parking for the storage unit, like for the, the storage Like product. Kim said, you know, the fella in her community has got a boat. You can't park it in the community. Um, food trucks are a big thing now. You sure. can't park them in these developments. Okay. I think, so here's where, if it's okay, here's, yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Now, I was just going to ask a question, which I normally don't do, and I apologize, but given that there's a lot of floodplain between the property that's being requested to be zoned and the existing CX3 at the intersection, I was wondering why that property in between the adjacent CX3 and the property being requested is not included in the rezoning request because I see that gap of R4 remaining forever, if that makes sense. And so. You want to know why I'm not rezoning the whole property? Well, at least all of the eastern portion. Because part of it, my mom is going to sign over to me so I can start a self-storage building for me and my family. The other part is got the LP gas storage tanks and we really didn't want to change it to commercial because it's a special use right now and we'd rather keep it separate because of business issues and family issues we've got. It's better to keep it separate at this time. Um, does it have the same ownership as this parcel? It's not going to. It's not going to. I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> other things there. Okay. Um, I think um, staff, um, Bel Donald Belk, is he still here? Is he behind you? Do you, do you kind of understand what the commission is trying to achieve? Here, do you think you could work with the applicant to help uh, describe some of our thoughts here? Because I agree with her, the, the parking that she has, the food trucks need to be in the back. I totally agree with that. What we were thinking is, you know, just some sort of buffer from the road. Yeah, a couple things that I would want to look at. I want to, uh, first of all, to I, I apologize for not being able to answer Commissioner O'Haver's question about the frontage specifically. I need to. Uh, research that a bit more. Uh, I'd like to talk about the possibility of including that frontage uh, and see what uh, that means in terms of, of streetscape, buffering, etc. Uh, also, uh, I would want to look at uh, how much space is actually there to do, say, a planting of some kind. Also, uh, I think I would certainly recommend to the applicant to go ahead and uh, uh, craft a condition regarding the placement of the parking and she mentioned a fence I think that could also be included in a condition uh, but those are the those are the two things the, the third thing that uh, I would need some advice I think from the city attorney's office this is an existing what, what we call an existing nonconformity uh, this the propane outdoor storage was in place before Raleigh zoning came in place. So I'm not sure um, the, if we, to, we were to extend the area of, of zoning to that eastern section, uh, what that would mean uh, in terms of have, because that existing nonconformity there. I think right now uh, it would have to be an industrial 
zoning in order to be compliant, but I, I would have to get some guidance on that question. But I think in terms of the placement of the parking, uh, the fence uh, that the applicant suggested, um, and the possibility of additional plantings or buffering along the street, I just need to see how the frontage, UL frontage would, I'm sorry, whatever that frontage is for the remainder of parcels. I think um, just to match up with the remainder of the CX, how that would affect the streetscape and what could be done there. Just to be clear, I'm not necessarily suggesting that we maintain the exact standards of the urban form. I'm just saying let's look at it, see where it can apply, assist the applicant, but let's set the streetscape the way that it, it needs to be for that corridor. And if there's some tweaks that we need to make to that, I think we're okay with it. It's just we're, we're looking for, you probably, Don, your assistant with the applicant to sort yeah. of help them navigate so that they can come back with some sort of meaningful conditions. I, I think we're generally all in support of it. We're just yeah. trying to set the, the, the standard for the streetscape. Yeah, and I appreciate that, Commissioner O'Haver. And I just had a thought that, that perhaps a condition that would replicate uh, what could take place along the streetscape that would kind of match up with the existing CX would be appropriate. Also, uh, with respect to Ms. Thaxton, she is uh, pursuing this application on her own. She does not have the services of an attorney, so uh, we have been assisting her uh, through, throughout the process. Thank you. We certainly appreciate that, Belk, as well. Thank you. Um, and then as you look at those conditions, just understand how it would impact your layout. So as you're committing to something, just you know, make sure that you're happy with that. As yes, well. I've so. got an um, engineer that's helping me. Okay. And, um, like I said, you know, I want it to look good. Yeah. And when you pull in, when we're going to put that building on the left, and I want it to look nice because I've got, a, like I said, a friend that yeah. owns a hair salon, You're and good. I want to make sure it looks good for her to bring in customers. Great. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you to staff as well on this case. So we are deferring this until the next meeting, which is March. May 25th. May 25th. Do you want it to, do you want to come in on the next 25th. meeting, or would it be the 24th? Thank you. Yeah. 24th, yeah. yeah. Or do you want to wait? And do you want more time, or? OK, so the next meeting? OK. Next meeting. Yeah, conditions have to be in 10 days before uh, notice, so only a couple days. Right. And staff will work with the applicant to meet Thank those you. deadlines. Great. Thank you. All right. I just want to note again that um, we can put man on the moon, but we can't make a Mac that the battery lasts for more than two hours. And I didn't, I didn't bring my plug, so I'm going to be a little hampered over here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, moving on to case number Z7421. This request, this request has not yet been previously discussed. I would like to ask for a staff presentation from Hannah Reckha. All right, good morning. This is case Z7421, a request to rezone just under five acres from commercial mixed use, four stories, parking limited conditional use to uh, commercial use, 12 stories, urban general conditional use with the transit overlay district. So the site is three parcels bounded by Milburney Road, New Bern Avenue, and Shanta Drive. Uh, you can see the surrounding zoning um, is mixed use, a number of commercial mixed use districts in this area, um, and then farther west of the site uh, is residential zoning. Here's a context for the site. This is just before New Bern Avenue crosses I-440. Um, south of the site is Wake Med's Raleigh campus and a number of other medical uses. Um, and then farther along New Bern Avenue are commercial and industrial uses. And then there's a park and Greenway property to the north. Take a closer look, you can see the site is um, undeveloped and forested. The other parcel on this block is a Walgreens location. You can see the Crabtree Creek Greenway that runs uh, north of the property. 
Here are a few views of the site from uh, its many frontages. Um, you can see it's um, forested. And there are three um, requested zoning conditions. The first is off, uh, requirement for art installation um, that would be visible from the portion of the public greenway that's in, in the Milburney right-of-way. I'll offer a clarification on that one. I think the agenda item misstates that the art would be located in the right-of-way, but the, the condition um, is speaking to where it's visible from. And then there's uh, two other conditions one offering a maximum area of retail use and another maximum area of office use on the site. And so the um, changes uh, maintaining the base district and a significant increase in the maximum building height uh, and then a change of frontage from a hybrid frontage to an uh, urban frontage and application of the transit overlay district. So residential Entitlement is increasing significantly, and then office and retail are capped by those zoning conditions. I'll note that these estimates show um, what's possible under uh, the base district and don't reflect the height bonus um, for the affordable housing, provision of affordable housing units. Um, that would allow up to 18 stories if a developer were to take advantage of, of that um, height bonus in the TOD. The site has a higher walk and bike score than the citywide average and higher proximity to jobs and um, lower cost of transportation than the city as a whole. There are two bus services that, uh, bus lines that serve the site, both having 15 minute service and then um, New Bern Avenue is, is the location of a future BRT route as well. The request would add, uh, significantly add um, possible housing units um, to the site. They don't include any guaranteed subsidized units, um, but it would increase the um, permit a variety of housing types, allow smaller unit, um, and uh, is located within walking distance of transit. And some uh, notes on our demographic and land use history analysis. Uh, EJ screen shows the surrounding population, high proportion of um, racial minorities, low income populations, and um, younger, under, under five years of age, uh, when compared with the citywide average. And then to put this, the annexation of this property in uh, context and history, there was in, in the 1960s, which is uh, when the Fair Housing Act was passed. So the future land use map designates the site as community mixed use, which aligns with commercial mixed use. Um, the future BRT station that this site would be near um, is designated as a campus and emerging urban center um, station, which uh, the future land use map recommends uh, heights between two and 20 stories. So the request, uh, requested 12 story CX district is consistent with the future land use map. And then the urban form map, uh, this site is within um, a transit station area, and so the urban frontage that's, um, urban frontage and application of the TOD are both consistent with uh, urban form map. So the request is consistent overall uh, with the comprehensive plan, uh, including, as I said, the future land use map and the urban form map. There are a number of policies that this request triggered, uh, many of which are in the equitable development around transit section of the land use um, chapter of the comprehensive plan. So aside from future land use map consistency, um, touches on um, capitalizing on transit access, uh, stationary land uses, uh, the, the building heights in station areas, as well as just the general composition of mixed use areas, um, encouraging nodal development rather than strip development, and then pedestrian friendly development. Uh, increasing housing entitlement, uh, frontage and urban form, and encouraging pedestrian uses and discouraging auto-oriented uses. Um, so as a reminder, the transit overlay district prohibits uh, a number of auto-oriented uses um, where it's applied. And there were a few inconsistent policies to note, uh, reinforcing the urban pattern. Uh, the requested height is significantly different from what currently exists in the area. Uh, so while the request uh, 
is consistent with a number of policies, uh, sort of envision the future development around transit uh, and in the area. It is uh, different from what's currently on the ground right now. And then there is a policy in the existing New Bern area specific guidance that uh, recommends a hybrid frontage, so parking limited frontage for the site. Um, there are other urban form policies that would recommend an urban frontage as well, and um, the pending New Bern station area planning is likely to, to result in changes to the comprehensive plan and um, amendments to the existing New Bern area specific guidance. So that some, uh, concludes the staff presentation. Your deadline for action is in the beginning of July. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, now uh, we would like to hear from the applicant. The applicant has 10 minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good morning. It is still morning. Molly Stewart, Morningstar Law Group. I'm here representing the applicant, and I also have with me today uh, two members of the ownership group, Dr. Balabai Patel, as well as uh, Dr. Prabhakar Vaidya. We also have Mr. J.W. Sheeran, our engineering consultant, with us in case there are any questions. I don't have a lot of additional explanation today um, because this request really represents a case where uh, the owner, the applicant, really took a look at the city's policies in this area uh, and uh, is, seek is seeking to implement those policies. Uh, and that is uh, true in, in every respect, uh, in, including uh, with respect to the TOD overlay, uh, applying that urban frontage, which as you heard has some mixed guidance, um, but the trend seems to be toward that urban frontage, uh, and, and applying that even though we do have a, a site with three frontages, it's, it's always challenging to uh, to, to comply with those urban frontages in that situation, um, but, but it has been offered here, uh, as well as a recognition of the fact that this site represents uh, a juncture of the Greenway and the bus rapid transit. Uh, and, and in recognition of that, they wanted to provide a landmark um, that, that uh, offered condition related to public art on the Greenway side of the property to serve as a landmark um, for those arriving by Greenway, um, perhaps trying to connect to the bus rapid transit. We held our two neighborhood meetings uh, for this request, and in those meetings, we heard no opposition. So I will close my presentation, and we are here for questions. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, any other comments from applicant or f those in favor? Okay. Uh, is there anyone here to speak in opposition of this request? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to now allow for questions and comments from commissioners. Uh, just one quick question. On, I noticed under the previous prohibited uses, there's a list like bar, nightclub, vehicle sales. I understand that's probably not going to be their intent, but should we uh, entertain the idea of keeping that in as prohibited uses for this particular site? And would the applicant um, consider that? In our outreach to the neighborhood, we heard no concerns about this issue uh, and feel that it is you know, an, an, an area trending toward urban uh, with no particular need to prohibit that. Um, also, you know, the, the intent, as you see with the 12-story request, is to build up. Um, so any development there will have to um, be thoughtful about who's above them. Um, so we don't see this as a particular concern in, in, this, in this location. So, okay, so the answer is you're not willing to add those pro prohibited uses? If, if, there's a, if there's a particular need, we can have that discussion. Okay. I'll, I can go ask, but um, it's not something that's been considered at this point. Um, I may have missed it. Did, did, was there more guidance on what the current proposed use is? Uh, no, so this is uh, a, an owner request, uh, not, not a developer, and seeking to uh, really just implement the plan for mixed uses sort of at a median height for this area. Um, if I may, I think the intention of the TOD height uh, bonus is based off of existing zoning, or you know, it's not asking for 12 and then saying we could go to 18. If we provide affordable housing, I mean, you're asking for 12, so the TOD is like kind of pre that. So, 
you know, I just wanted to kind of point that out that that I think it's odd to say in the application, this might be uh, the, the staff presentation, but to say that there's a TOD density bonus opportunity, the density bonus opportunity exists today, correct? If the overlay is not in place, then no, it would not. Okay. Uh, assuming that the overlay is in place, then the TOD, because I, I think the fact that it's mentioning the TOD in here feels misleading to me because they're asking for a height increase to 12 stories, saying, oh, yeah, and if this overlay, could, we could go to 18, but, I mean, I'm thinking that that, that, in, that is an incentive program that is to be established, but they're asking for that additional height right now. Is my concern getting that the TOD doesn't apply to the property right now, so yeah. they don't have any incentive to do mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. They're asking for 12 Got it. plus an incentive with the TOD. I can further address it as well. It was taken into account with the fact that the height guidance for the area actually goes up to 20 stories, uh, so we have not sort of maximized to that at this point. Uh, I mean, we'd be remiss not to mention it. We talked earlier on a, on a project with a developer, and some of the concerns were no affordable housing being mentioned, and that was a concern of a number of the commissioners, and we passed it. Sounds like this is a technicality, unfortunately, um, but I agree 100%. This is a TOD. It's going to be our first BRT. It's just, you know, we're not going to get to the affordable housing issue until there's some changes made in the city. Unfortunately, it's a technicality. I'm disappointed that the applicant's not willing to at least consider it. Um, but we approved one earlier that also didn't provide affordable housing. So I'm not sure if we if we stay consistent. Um, otherwise, everything about the plan is great. It's consistent, so on and so forth. But again, that's the whole point of the BRT, the TOD overlay, the density. It's just we're not there yet. Well, I just wanted to clarify, on the previous case, the, the reason that I approved it without the affordable housing was because of the substantial dedication to other public city services in terms of acreage for the, both the fire department and um, the transit stop. And with the very high values for the acreage there, the fact that that monetary donation or you know, contribution was being made to the general public, to me, offset the other contribution for affordable housing. So that, that and this project, um, does not propose to either of those. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I agree 100. percent I wasn't throwing shade on anybody. I also yeah, yeah. I also I approved I also approved the last one. I'm just making a comment yeah. that we'd be remiss not to talk about it on this case when we talked about it twice on another case. And so I just want to make sure it comes forward because it's an issue with the community. It's one we're struggling with. It's one that this commission this commission has talked about. And so. I'm just staying consistent and putting it out there. I agree, and I'm supporting what you're saying. In that case, this this one does not provide any public good, um, yeah. right. good contribution. Yeah. So I think it would be consistent to, if not even more consistent, to be concerned about affordable housing here, even though we did not require that specific public contribution in the last project. And was the North Hills one in a TOD? Oh well, I mean, it's. I mean, obviously, I mean, just I think, the I area. Think this one has. I mean, it's. You know, this this particular area along Newburn is the exact reason why we're looking at a TOD program for affordable housing. I think North Hills is a slightly different set of circumstances, um, but I get what you're saying. But um, I do think that this one has substantially more uh, interest in seeing that that type of support in the community. Right, and and this has uh, this has been addressed in a couple of ways. One, um, in as I mentioned earlier, we had taken into account the fact that we're not maximizing the height guidance already, so that in the event we were to take advantage of the overlay we're requesting to put in place, which provides that incentive for affordable housing, that's, um, that's the mechanism that the TOD overlay uses to encourage affordable housing in this area. So um, in requesting that 12-story, um, you're absolutely right that there would be an opportunity to go higher than that by providing affordable housing. Uh, and so that is that's the mechanism for addressing it in that case. It's different than sort of um, the, the Midtown policy that, that came up in the other um, location. Yeah, I feel like given the opportunity of the applicant requesting 20 stories or 12 with the TOD, requesting 12 with the TOD, if they really want to build 20, builds in that incentive for affordable housing. It's the way I'm looking at it anyway. 
I agree with that, and I'm ready to make a motion in case any, unless anyone else. No, you can you can make the motion. I just want to say publicly as well. I want to be a little bit sensitive to how we're describing where affordable housing needs to be, and for us to say, oh, this is where affordable housing needs to be. It needs to be throughout the entire community, whether it's North Hills or New Bern Avenue. So. I agree. Let's make the let's make the motion. Appreciate them at least considering affordable housing. We'll see how that turns out. Um, but we need it. We need it throughout the city, not just in certain areas. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion to approve rezoning case Z seventy four twenty one, and to adopt the pr um, proposed consistency statement located in the agenda materials dated May tenth, twenty twenty two. Second. Great. Uh, Commissioner Miller has offered a motion approval, and Commissioner Reigns has seconded the motion. All of those in favor? Great. Any opposed? Seeing none, uh, the motion passes 6 0. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question, too? I know we're getting towards the end. And, Go ahead. Uh, but again, this is a situation where they've put forward conditions. So, but I guess this is the first one, so they could come back with yeah. with conditions correct we could have asked them to consider mm -hmm. that correct. before you all get to your next and I think last case um, heard an update from an applicant uh, for Z 66 21 which is a case you heard right before this last one mm -hmm. and the applicant has asked if they could come back to your June 14th meeting that's perfect. As opposed fine. to the next meeting. So I just wanted to publicly announce that. Thank you. Yes, yeah. June 14th for the last uh, Z6621 is fine. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, Commissioner Miller has to leave. Um, do we still have quorum if Commissioner Miller leaves? Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Got just a couple more to go. Um, all right, uh, case number Z8221. This request has not been previously discussed. I'd like to ask for a staff presentation from Don Belk. Thank you. Hello again. Uh, this is uh, an sorry assemblage. To of interrupt right before I have to leave. Um, I just, I as as chair of the text change committee, I just wanted to announce that um, the meeting that's the regular meeting that's scheduled for next Tuesday, um, May 17th from four to six o'clock. I think um, I spoke with staff, and we may need to move that to Wednesday or Thursday of next week. And I'll speak to the other committee members, but I just wanted to make an announcement to the general public that that will be moved as well. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Sorry for that interruption. Um, Z8221, uh, this is an assemblage of parcels. There are 16 parcels in total uh, comprising eight acres. And the request is a rezone from residential six to a mix or a combination of RX7 and OX7, uh, both with parking limited frontages and conditions. Your deadline is July 9th. This is within the Crabtree area. Note the prevalence of commercial mixed-use zoning. Uh, the R6 uh, zoning is uh, mostly of the uh, from the Crabtree Wood subdivision, which uh, borders the site to the west and south. An aerial view. Uh, note uh, Crabtree Valley Mall there. Um, there is also uh, other commercial uses uh, near the site as well as medium-scale residential uh, also nearby. An aerial close-up here. And some streetscapes. I wanted to, uh, to show uh, the existing uh, conditions of the uh, Crabtree Woods subdivision here in these perspectives. Uh, note that all of these units um, are um, either, uh, they're, they're all attached homes, either duplex, triplex, and I think there are a couple of uh, four family units uh, within these, uh, all of a residential feel. Um, other street views, again from uh, Cornwall, place that is uh, within the proposed rezoning area. Edwards Mill bordering the area here looking northwest. 
number of conditions, um, a couple of prohibited uses uh, for both RX and OX. Um, the applicant has set a maximum height uh, for those parcels um, uh, located uh, there. These would be the uh, westernmost parcels in the proposal. Um, and these would be limited to three stories and 50 feet. And these are the two parcels that are directly adjacent to the, uh, the remainder of the R6 zoning uh, uh, to the west. Um, the applicant has also uh, set conditions on the uh, design and uh, other specifications of the structured parking that would be facing any public street. Uh, including um, specifics on the facades of parapet walls and uh, lighting. They've also provided a condition to give existing tenants, I mentioned the multifamily aspects of these properties, property owners uh, will provide tenants with 60 days written notice before the termination of their leases. Note the increases in residential density maximum units uh, as a result of this change from residential six to the residential and office mixed uses uh, in the differences, uh, no differences in the uh, setbacks here. Under our carbon footprint analysis, uh, the proposal has an average, uh, meets the city average on walk score uh, but has higher scores than the city average in, in bike, transit, uh, the transportation cost index, and job proximity index. Although the property does not include subsidized units, it does, uh, it meets uh, uh, positively these factors in our affordability analysis. Uh, additional housing supply within this walking distance of transit, smaller uh, lots and a variety of housing types. Um, our EJ screen, similar to city, city averages for a percentage of minority populations and low income populations, but it is less uh, linguistically isolated and has a lower population uh, of residents that have less than a high school education than the citywide average and we found no restrictive covenants or historical covenants uh, that uh, had exclusionary clauses. Uh, from the future land use map, uh, this uh, particular request is consistent with the future land use map for medium scale residential and office and mixed use residential. It is consistent overall with the comprehensive plan and is also consistent with the urban form map. A note to these key policies, consistency here, and is also consistent with a couple of policies from the Crabtree uh, area plan as part of section 16 in the comprehensive plan. A couple of inconsistencies were noted. Uh, the density transitions um, and the infill compatibility, and this is, this is uh, most, uh, these inconsistencies are really most acute uh, for those uh, properties uh, within the existing Crabtree Woods subdivision on the uh, eastern side of Arc Arkelton Drive that face the development. So it's a, a very limited area that really uh, bring the inconsistency here. Your deadline for action would be July 9th. Uh, and again, uh, noting uh, those uh, disparities for those adjoining uh, residential parcels that are uh, located south of Cornwall and east of Arkelton. And there are um, three uh, PC meetings. I believe I have these dates incorrect. That would be May 24th, June 14th, and June 28th. Apologize for that. Concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Next, we would like to hear from the applicant. The applicant has a total of 10 minutes to speak.
Good afternoon, commissioners. Nice to see you. Um, Jennifer Ashton with Longleaf Law Partners. I'm here today on behalf of the applicant. Um, Don, how do I get my presentation pulled up? Oh, no problem. Get that right up. So as Don mentioned, we have an assemblage of about 16 parcels, about 8.101 acres of land. Um, currently, it is not a single family neighborhood. This is more a predominantly multifamily neighborhood. There are a few single family homes scattered throughout the Crabtree Woods area, but as I mentioned, it's predominantly uh, multifamily. We do have frontage along Edwards Mill Road, our Kelton Drive and Cornwall Place. Currently, the zoning is R6. Uh, we have two land use designations within our assemblage. One is that medium scale residential and the other is office and residential mixed use. And the urban format designates the property as lying within a city growth center and Edwards Mill Road as an urban thoroughfare. Um, Don also mentioned there is the Crabtree Small Area Plan, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Um, we are seeking two zoning designations for the assemblage. One is the RX-7 parking limited frontage and the other is OX-7 with that parking limited frontage. Um, once I get to the future land use map, you'll see that those zoning designations actually match the future land use map designations. Um, some things to note, uh, staff has found us consistent with the future land use map and the urban form map and the comp plan overall. Um, during our community outreach at the neighborhood meetings, we did not have any real controversy or um, opposition to this project. In fact, a lot of owners actually wanted to join in on the project. <laughs> um, unfortunately, they were more in the heart of the neighborhood and they weren't immediately adjacent to our site, contiguous with our site, so they wouldn't be able to join us. But um, this whole area near Crabtree Valley Mall is up and coming as an urban area. Um, there's been a few rezonings in the last year that have dramatically increased height and density in the area. And so our parcel, we're trying, we're, we're following that trend, which is actually laid out in the small area plan to become more urban. So the existing conditions that we have, as you can see in yellow, are our 16 parcels. Uh, we tried very hard to keep our parcels at the edge of the existing neighborhood. We did not want to go into the heart of the neighborhood. Um, to our, let's see, that would be to our southeast, we have the Pinnacle Apartment site, which I'll show you was just rezoned last year for a seven-story CX and a 12-story CX. We also have another apartment complex up here. We have the J. Alexander's restaurant. We have the Martinique condos over um, to our northwest. And then, of course, we have the Crabtree Valley Mall uh, to our northeast. So the current zoning, um, as you can see, we have a ton of CX around us. Uh, we have a lot of CX-12, which these two apartment sites have. We also have CX-7 that was just rezoned in 2021. This is the Pinnacle apartment site. And that does back up directly to this Crabtree Woods neighborhood. Um, also over here, there was the uh, Highwood site that was just rezoned in the last year to CX-7 as well. Um, so we are looking to uh, rezone just our parcels right here. But keep in mind, when we talk about this rezoning, we are talking about parcels that are surrounded by CX-7 and CX-12. So the future land use map, um, a lot of the parcels around us are office and residential mixed use or regional mixed use. So we're talking about, you know, not these single family neighborhood land use designations. Um, as you can see, we have, uh, I believe it's six parcels right here that have an office and residential mixed use land use designation. That is where that OX7 zoning is going to go. And then for the remainder of the site, which is designated as medium scale residential, that's where the RX7 zoning is going to go. So again, we tried to match our zoning requests to the land use designations. Uh, one other thing to note on this map, the entire Crabtree Woods neighborhood is medium scale residential. So it's not low, low density residential, it's not moderate density residential. It's all medium scale residential. The urban form map does identify um, this area and a lot of the area around us as an urban growth center. This also matches what is stated in the Crabtree Small Area Plan, that this whole area is ripe for redevelopment as a more mixed-use urban area. 
also Edwards Mill Road, a portion of it is designated as an urban thoroughfare. We are proposing that parking limited frontage, which is consistent with both the city growth center and the urban, for, um, urban thoroughfare designations. So as Don mentioned, we do have a number of zoning conditions. Um, I'm gonna talk about some in more detail than others. Uh, we do have some use prohibitions based on the RX zoning district and also the OX zoning district. We do have a height limitation for two properties and I'll go back so you can see where those are. The height limitations are for these two parcels right here. Um, we have limited the height on those two parcels to three stories or 50 feet in height maximum. And the reason for doing that, uh, we, we felt that we were kind of in, we were getting more impact to the existing neighborhood. So we wanted to make sure that we were going ahead and codifying some height transitions there. Um, we believe it's a very different story on the opposite side of our Kelton Drive. Here we've really um, included all of the parcels that we could without any gaps. Um, so there won't be a similar height transition over here, but I can show you um, these two parcels right here, which are not part of our assemblage. They are, they have very deep setbacks into their site. So we didn't feel that the height transitions were as necessary there. Um, for example, this parcel, I think the existing, it's like a quadplex back there. It's set back 210 feet from the roadway. So it's a good distance away from the roadway. And then this parcel right here, it's set back almost 80 feet from the roadway. So again, um, that's, that's why we're not doing height transitions over there. Okay, so um, as Don mentioned, we also have conditions relating to parking deck screening, not only of vehicles, but also of lighting. And then finally, we do have for the existing tenants within our assemblage, we're offering to give 60 days written notice before their leases end. Our hope is to keep those residents in their units for as long as possible as the parcel develops out, especially if we're able to phase the development. But as I mentioned before, we are consistent with the future land use map and the comp plan overall, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. All right, uh, opening it up to members of the public. Is anyone here to speak on behalf of this case? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to bring it back to the uh, table here for discussion. Do any commissioners have any questions about this application? <laughs> Maybe just a quick clarification from staff. I believe um, neighborhood transition zones would still apply in this location, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what were some of the discussion topics brought up by neighbors at your neighborhood meetings? A lot of people were wondering what was happening with Edwards Mill Road. Um, let me try to get to the urban format. Um, a, a lot of people were saying that, you know, the sidewalk ne network over there is kind of broken. There's parts of Edwards Mill that have sidewalks, other parts that don't. Um, so the urban format does show this as part of the city's um, future street plan. Edwards Mill Road is going to be realigned at some point, um, and then sidewalks will be added to the new alignment. Um, the, there's the existing Crabtree Creek Greenway Trail right here along the mall. And Jason Myers is here. He probably can talk about this in more detail. But my understanding is that the intent is to eventually maybe move that Greenway Trail out of the existing floodway and turn Crabtree Valley Avenue into a more pedestrian street. And then this Edwards Mill Road realignment will accommodate the, the car traffic. Um, so that was that was a big conversation, kind of what was happening with Edwards Mill Road. Was there going to be new sidewalks? And then really, um, a, there was just more interest in what we were proposing to do. You know, were we looking at high dense office use, high intensity retail use? Um, no, obviously with the OX designation and the RX designations, we're um, not doing like these high office towers. So those were really the big topics of conversation during the neighborhood meetings. Um, question for Ms. Ashton, the OX, I mean, I don't see in the staff report any of the existing versus proposed on what they're allowed on the OX. It still only just mentions residential density. Why, why is that? And what's the purpose of the OX in this area if it's all multifamily housing? So the 
future land use map designates those six parcels as having the land use designation of office and residential mixed use. So there is the opportunity to have some limited retail or also some office uses. We thought that would provide, um, keeping an OX zoning there would provide a nice buffer because remember directly to the north, we have regional mixed use, which is much more intense. So the office uh, mixed use zoning designation will provide a good buffer as you're heading into the neighborhood. Thank you. Um, just because it's been in discussion on previous cases, affordable housing is not a condition, I understand. But again, this is a great opportunity, especially for the location. Um, I just wanted to make a comment in general that it, it would be nice yeah. to see. But. Yeah. Agreed. And again, maybe uh, I know it's there's nobody here. People, people might still be watching. Probably not. Probably having lunch. Um, maybe again, we need to be talking about housing affordability versus affordable housing. I know that's a sort of a tweak, but still, there are opportunities to bake some of that in without necessarily getting into some of the concerns, I guess, that maybe some folks have. But anyways, I agree with your sentiment. Quick question for the applicant. Is there a, uh, sometimes we've um, seen a notice, like a extended notice, like a 60-day, is that something that is, um, Potentially included in this, or it is. Oh, yes, okay. it Sorry. is. Yeah, we wanted to make sure that the existing residents had notice, you know, of when their leases are going to end, regardless of what their lease actually says. And mm -hmm. as I mentioned earlier, the goal here is to try to keep these residents in their units for as long as possible as the site builds out. So having that sixty-day notice will will uh, hopefully ensure that they're they have adequate time to to find alternative housing. Yeah, um, yeah. The uh, we just don't have a lot of options at our disposal for the uh, affordable housing component because it does get rid of, you know. I mean, it is the housing that you've purchased is also probably very expensive housing as well in this current market. Um, but um, I don't know what we can do about that. I mean, I was going to say, we have, I mean, since it, it appears, I was zooming around on Google Earth, um, that, you know, maybe we are displacing some of the, mm -hmm. you know, housing affordability that, mm -hmm. that exists. We have talked to other applicants about um, if they would consider making the plan to work with the current residents and finding another affordable location or providing affordable location. Again, this is where we need it. Um, they've, we've asked them to come back with a little bit more robust plan. Uh, there's really not a way to put a con I guess you could put a condition on that. I don't know that anybody's ever taken us up on it, but we've, we've talked about it again, just in the vein of trying to be consistent on what we've talked with other folks about, even though I know we're all tired and, and just probably want to move on. I mean, I don't know, maybe that's something to talk about in one of our strategic committee meetings about how we can encourage some conditions to make those those plans more robust when we're displacing some of the existing stock so and not coming back and offering something to replace it yeah i don't know maybe just to be clear i think um i totally agree it would be awesome to um include some provisions for affordable housing here i think in previous cases my my position on that was the the area plan for that specific area recommended provisions for that for buildings over seven stories. So I'm not aware that that kind of guidance exists in this location. So I totally agree. I would, I would love to see it, but I think in terms of, you know, consistency, I think for me, that's, that's sort of why I would not necessarily require it. Although I'd love to see it. Yeah. So your um, client looking at class A all day long development, or are they looking for kind of middle market? There is no set, 
plan right now. Um, I, I don't even believe they have a developer on board, so I wouldn't be able to answer that. Um, but to go to the comment earlier, the, the small area plan for this area does not have a specific recommendation for affordable housing like you would see in the Midtown area plan. Um, with that being said, you know, these parcels, given that this is an up and coming urban area, these parcels are probably very underutilized properties. So we are gonna be increasing the housing supply. And there is a great transit opportunity that already exists. Um, I think Don mentioned we have a higher than average transit score for the area. So, um, you know, those two things put together more units and then also a, a high transit score and we'll be adding sidewalks for higher walkability. Um, and there's existing job opportunities within the area. I think all those things together will, will help with the affordability. Are there options to purchase currently on these parcels then? Um, so luckily, um, one owner owns, I believe, let me make sure I'm getting this right, 13 of the 16 parcels. Got it. So it's one owner. Then there's three individual owners. I don't know if they have contracts to purchase those or not. But all of those individual owners are considered applicants? That is then? correct. Okay. Yes, that is correct. Any other thoughts on this one? All right, with that, uh, no additional comment. Um, just gonna bring it to the commissioner to make a motion. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, I move to recommend adoption of the proposed consistency statement dated May 10th, 2022, contained in the agenda materials, and to recommend approval of the zoning amendment. Uh, the action taken is reasonable in the public interest because it would create additional housing supply, especially attached in townhome building types, which are relatively more affordable than single family detached. The request would inc increase the supply of and available space for office uses within a city growth center. The request represents an infill development near an urban thoroughfare that is supportive of continued investment in transit and pedestrian facilities within a city growth center. And this proposal is consistent with a number of policies uh, and area plan policies. All right. Commissioner Dantel, I'll second. Thank you. All right, we have a uh, motion to approve and a second. All those in favor, raise your hands. Great, any opposed? Seeing none, the motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, we made it through all our cases today so this concludes all the discussion items on our agenda next is approval of the minutes i'd like to entertain a motion to approve the meeting minutes i have a edit request okay, great. on april 12th agenda item c7621 looks like there may have been duplicates of a i's and nays so i may want to check um check that i think three of them were copied from both Great, okay, so with that uh, friendly amendment to the minutes, um, uh, do I have a commissioner who would like to vote to approve the minutes with that amendment? With that, with, with that comment, I uh, vote to, I uh, recommend approval of, can I, can I do all three meet? Yes. Meeting, all three meeting minutes. Great. April 12th, 21st, and 26th. Great, thank you, do I have a second? Second, great, okay. All in favor, raise your hand. Do we need to do that? I can't remember, okay. All in denied, nope, okay. Pa motion passes, 5-0. Okay, uh, now on to the report for the chairperson. Um, so uh, Blaney had already discussed the text change committee, um, so there might be a change there. Um, there is nothing currently in the strategic planning committee. Um, I am welcome to bring on any additional conversation on affordable housing as always, um, but whatever is recommended. Um, so I think we should just make note of that um, discussion item. Uh, Commissioner Bennett is not here for the infrastructure mobility committee. Do we know from staff if we're meeting again for that? I do not believe they have any pending items. Okay. And uh, Committee of the Whole will meet uh, Thursday, May 26th. There are pending items, including a TOD zoning case. Any other comments from commissioners?
commissioners? Any updates? Okay. Next is report of the members. I guess that's that. Uh, next is report of the deputy planning director. Thank you. Um, I won't belabor the point. You've got my report in your backup, so feel free to read through it and see what actions have been taken. Great. Thank you. Um, and then any other pending items that need to be voted out? Um, my section and Nicole's section look clear. I don't know about the others. Are we good? Great. Okay, well, with that, that concludes our meeting for today. See you all next time. Thank you.